So on behalf of the Association of uh, Asia Scholars, uh, I welcome all our participants, our speaker, Professor Kanti Bajpai, to this uh, 12th session, 12th webinar, weekly webinar every Wednesday that we have been organizing since the month of May, taking advantage, as you rightly said, the silver lining uh, during the pandemic and uh, bringing in people, uh, eminent speakers like yourself from different parts of the world uh, to, pr to uh, present to us uh, their perspectives on various issues. And of course, China has been in the room uh, quite a lot uh, during each of our webinars. Uh, we are uh, an association of Asia scholars, a registered body since 2005. Uh, we have organized uh, several conferences in India and abroad as well. Uh, we have partnered with several uh, universities, again, uh, in India, in China, and other countries, uh, as well as Indian Council of World Affairs and uh, the Ministry of External Affairs. We've organized several international conferences, bringing out several publications uh, since 2005. And uh, we have uh, a journal in the name of Millennial Asia. The journal is also 10 years uh, old and uh, it is a publication with Sage Publishers. Uh, we initially had a biannual uh, issue, but now it's a triennial issue. And for possibly because the number of uh, submissions has increased rapidly, we are expecting that by 2021, this would become possibly a quarterly, so four issues a year. And uh, we are also planning uh, to organize some other uh, uh, activities, you know, a conference uh, to commemorate 150 years of Gandhi. And uh, we'll soon be making those announcements uh, on our website and through our social media platforms. So we are really uh, very delighted to have you with us. Our uh, association, as I said, 15 years old, bringing in almost 300 Asia fellows plus uh, and counting from uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and China, Japan, uh, South Korea. We were uh, the fellows from 2000 to 2010, cohorts of the uh, Asian Scholarship Foundation which was an offshoot of the Institute of International Education of the United States. So uh, after that, we have all been together, working together as a team. And Professor Swaran Singh is the president, uh, and I am uh, helping him as the Secretary General. So with these words, I hand it over to you, Swaran, to please take forward. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Rina Marwa. Uh, to help Kanti uh, recall uh, about this association, uh, let me say uh, as soon as I had joined uh, uh, CPOD when he was my other colleague in the program for the Summer Studies, uh, I had to go to China for about nine months. Uh, that might help him recall. So I was uh, the second cohort of Asia Fellows, which was a fellowship that allowed the, each of the selected uh, fellows to go to another Asian country for up to nine months or more. Uh, so that may help him uh, perhaps remember that I have to do that. That is the fellowship which alumni uh, put together, have started the association now for a few years. Uh, we are starting a discussion, as, as I was just telling Professor Kanti Vajpayee, uh, on now Pakistan. So these three coming sessions today and plus two, uh, we'll be looking at uh, Pakistan related issues. Today, of course, we have a very, very eminent speaker. Star professor who's going to explain to us the cycles of cooperation and defection in, in, in India and Pakistan relations uh, in a specific period of 1994 to 2016. Uh, but Pakistan is going to continue, and we will have the next speaker, Saigrid Wolf, the professor and a senior fellow with Hyderabad South Asia Institute and a research director in, uh, with uh, another forum there, South Asia Democratic Forum. Uh, and that will be followed by another very uh, celebrated French, uh, the foremost uh, French scholar on Indian studies, uh, Christophe Jefferlo, who's going to speak on India's uh, friends in the Muslim world. So this is a continuing three sessions we will have. 
Uh, so Pakistan is going to be the flavor of uh, coming three weeks. In any case, Pakistan is writ large on Indian side uh, since independence. And uh, let me just briefly, you know, say something which is very structural as to what makes Pakistan such a, a preoccupation of India in general, not just India's foreign policy. A uh, lot of uh, uh, interesting fault lines in the very conception, in the establishment, and of course, uh, in uh, operationalizing that idea of Pakistan. Uh, most of you would remember a very famous speech of 11th August of uh, Jinnah, who was the uh, brain behind uh, you know, actually pushing this idea of uh, Muhammad Iqbal in, in Muhammad Iqbal and in making a real country out of it. And that 11th August speech talks about creating a secular Pakistan where all you know, groups, ethnic, religious, linguistic, will have equal rights as, as citizens, which was a kind of a contradiction with the whole idea since early 1920s of uh, some of these leaders trying to create a Muslim state. Indeed, also uh, two more very interesting uh, uh, kind of uh, counterintuitive uh, uh, realities of that time is a lot of very, very you know, powerful organizations, for example, Jamaat e Islami, had opposed uh, the creation of Pakistan. And several other leaders in the Muslim world had, had opposed, saying that Umma could not be restricted to any territorial boundary. So it's a stupid idea to think of creating a, a territorial state for Islam. Uh, and then second disjunction of the fact that uh, East Pakistan, the you know, strange or two parts of India, two sides of India, two parts of Pakistan, uh, in 71 decided to desert and then uh, underline the fact that their Muslim uh, identity was only second to them. It was a linguist, uh, linguistic identity which was primary to them, which again fundamentally questioned the very idea you know, of Pakistan. So that's idea of Pakistan and when it is operationalized on the ground, you see both uh, the boundaries um, uh, of Pakistan physically are not natural boundaries, they're completely artificial and even very, very you know, strange artificial boundaries because the Durand line, for example, cuts Pashtunistan in the middle uh, to Punjab. Punjab is cut in the middle on Indian side and uh, the Sindh and Rajasthan is cut, cut in the middle in the plains. Uh, so also uh, Bengal was cut, of course, by the British uh, much earlier uh, from the middle. Uh, and if linguistic identity is important, then you know it has to be Sonar Mangla in that case. Uh, so even the ground realities, territoriality around which nation states were to be built uh, had enormous certain uh, sort of uh, con contradictions built in that both idea and operationalization of Pakistan, which perhaps resulted in a very, very curious polity or politics, which saw uh, military repeated being in command either directly uh, ruling the country or ruling from uh, behind the doors in that sense. So, you know, you are hearing all kinds of things of the current prime minister being anointed. But more interesting is the fact that China, which was an atheist nation, was to become the closest friend of Islamic Republic of Pakistan. Uh, so a lot of uh, structural fault lines uh, makes Pakistan a curious case of a nation state and serves in that kind of leaderships uh, uh, germinating in Pakistan, that kind of policy germinating in Pakistan, uh, making India uh, preoccupied uh, with, uh, with the idea of Pakistan. Uh, so I think that is what makes Pakistan really such an obsession for all of us uh, who are uh, kind of aware of uh, you know, national policies or foreign policy. And we could not have had a better speaker today to speak to us in the first session of the three than Professor Kanti Vajpayee. I don't have to introduce him because he's such a well-known public intellectual. You possibly have read several of his books, articles, chapters, and commentaries in media. I want to quickly underline you know, the fact that he was a colleague of mine when I joined Jawaharlal Nehru University. And therefore, I want to underline bit of what you may not have read about him in, in public domain. Uh, professor Kanti Vajpayee was a star professor of uh, SIS and I, I have no qualm uh, in saying that we have not been able to fill that space even till yet. That vacuum still, still stays in, in our school. Uh, he was uh, 
darling of students, uh, but surprisingly also a great friend of faculty of uh, SIS and beyond. Uh, so that kind of personality in that sense uh, of giving some, I hope Kanti, sorry, I, I, please allow me to call you Kanti. Uh, Kanti, oh. mind by sharing this, uh, simple things like sitting with students when he was bored in and, and eating food to just make sure that brings in some attention of uh, you know, the mess managers to make sure the professor can't, he's eating here. So food must be perfectly fine. <laughs> Going out of the way, I have heard stories of him pushing cars of students if they are not starting at some time. Uh, despite being that you know globally known person and things like that, I, I, I have my personal experiences, can't even remember. I was not yet part of IDSA. I was not part of JNU. I was at IDSA, and uh, my first uh, seeing him, not uh, uh, making friends with him, was his uh, participating in some of the conferences at. Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, where I was working at that time. And I remember still his engaging as a young scholar with some of the senior generals and air commodores on issues of nuclear deterrence and things like that. So he was very noticeable. Uh, so he's someone who fills the room with his presence, I want to underline. And then, of course, uh, I had first good chance to be with him in a conference in Calcutta in 1998. I'm not sure if I remember this. Hmm. Uh, and we had a chance to walk after the dinner. We had a chance to go for morning walks around the lake uh, uh, near Ramakrishna uh, guest house where we were living. Mm -hmm. And and that meeting really appealed me. I already wanted to come to JNU, but I thought you know, if I was going to work with someone like Professor Kanti Vajpayee, I, I must doubly make my efforts to uh, join the Seaport of SIS. Uh, and I remember even broaching that subject with him in the morning walk near, near the lake. And he suggested several things to me, including the fact, I don't know if he remembers, he said, you should rehearse before going to the interview. And that, that advice I've given to so many of my students. In fact. Uh, so someone who genuinely engages anyone who meets him, uh, I think that is uh, a great powerful uh, part of uh, personality called the Professor Kanti Bajpayee, other than the intellectual, you know, don that he is, of course. Uh, so that is what I wanted to share with you. And I had a great privilege to know him, work with him, and I've known him since uh, I followed you know, his writings, etc. And then uh, sometime I have met him in some conferences. Uh, so it's a great pleasure and uh, almost, uh, let me say, honor to have uh, Professor Kanti Bajpayee address us today. And uh, I look forward to myself listening to him when he speaks. And the usual uh, way we do it here, Professor Kanti Bajpayee, is about 20, 45 minutes of initial exposition. Uh, but you're free if you take a little more time than that. Uh, but we want to engage in the visiting or, or uh, scholar who speaks to us in one-to-one -one discussion after that for about an hour and sometimes a little more. So that the participants get this great pleasure of being engaged with the speaker on one-to-one -on -one basis. So we'll try that. Sometimes if there are questions uh, are continuing, then we bunch them in the end. But that's the kind of uh, format that we follow. So I will now request uh, Professor Kanti Bajpayee to please uh, take the, uh, shall we say, floor uh, and then start his uh, initial exposition. Uh, Professor Kanti Bajpayee. Well, thank you very much, uh, Swaran, um, uh, for such a, a kind and uh, lengthy uh, introduction. Actually, uh, you made me quite emotional. <laughs> thinking back to those days and, and uh, our first meetings together, as well as, of course, uh, interactions with students and, and colleagues. Uh, I've always missed it, and um, I probably will uh, always miss uh, JNU days. Um, so um, this is a topic uh, which, in a sense, uh, you know, um, and by the way, I want to thank Meena uh, Marwa very much for setting up all the logistics. I don't think we've met, or perhaps if we've met, uh, it was very briefly. But it's very good to see you on the, on screen, and and thanks for assembling a, a nice group here. Uh, and uh, so, a, a good afternoon to all, all of you. Um, the moment, of course, uh, I suppose, is uh, a moment where it, we're thinking so much in India about China. Uh, but of course, as Swaran pointed out so well, uh, Pakistan is constantly uh, over the horizon, and and in fact, uh, far more deeply. Uh, kind of um, embedded in our day-to-day -day thinking and concerns. Uh, from ordinary people, I think, uh, right all the way up to Indian leaderships and decision makers. So 
uh, I think it's always important to uh, continue to think about uh, uh, India-Pakistan relations. Uh, I'm very aware that there is a view in the strategic community that perhaps uh, uh, China is the more important issue, that uh, relations with Pakistan uh, are either in a stall mode or are quite handleable by India. Um, and so there's been some, it seems to me, some uh, uh, kind of diminution uh, or pulling back from, uh, from uh, an interest in, in Pakistan. So I'm very glad to know that uh, I'm doing this session and there are two more follow-up sessions on, on uh, India and Pakistan. I think it's still a very, very important issue. And uh, as we can see uh, in a lot of the commentary, particularly in India, uh, even the India-China issue that's brewing right now seems to have its links to uh, India-Pakistan. The motivation uh, behind the, uh, by the way, I should say this is a paper. Uh, it's a paper I finished a few weeks ago, although I, I revised uh, relatively recently. Um, it's written in honor of my former PhD supervisor, I should say my late uh, supervisor, Stephen Cohen, uh, who was a professor at the University of Illinois where I did my PhD. And uh, then later he was at the Brookings Institution. And of course his last major book uh, was on India-Pakistan called Shooting for a Century. But anyway, he died last year, and, uh, uh, sadly, at quite a young age, uh, uh, just over, uh, just into his 80s. And Shramit Ganguly at uh, Indiana University of Bloomington, who was my senior in the PhD program and in Shaw Mystery at um, the University of Cincinnati, have organized a volume. And so this paper is really in, in honor of Steve and his interests in India-Pakistan relations, which I think was the issue closest to his heart apart from civil military relations. Um, so there's that kind of almost personal motivation. But the other motivation, of course, is that um, so much of the work on India-Pakistan relations, uh, as you probably all aware, uh, dwell and focus on conflict, on the conflict between them, uh, and um, try to explain that conflict or trace its outlines. And this is quite understandable. Um, there's no point uh, trying to underplay the degree of conflict between the two countries. And uh, I mentioned Shumit Ganguly when he was a couple of years senior to me. Uh, he wrote probably the first um, more theoretically inclined book trying to explain uh, India-Pakistan conflict. Uh, so those of you who will remember his first book was The Origins of War in South Asia. Um, and uh, so from that time, that was the early 80s, I was quite interested in uh, you know, trying to account for the conflict as much as anybody else. But as it happens, when it got to my turn to write a thesis, uh, looking around for topics, I remember Steve Cohen saying to me, uh, why don't you, in a sense, try and uh, do the opposite, look for um, explanations of what cooperation there has been. Uh, we tend to not think so much about the cooperative acts. Uh, and I went at it slightly sideways, my PhD was on uh, the origins of uh, SARC. Uh, but, so it looked at cooperation in South Asia more broadly than, um, than just India-Pakistan, although India-Pakistan was quite a bit of the story. So my thesis was not a, a, a reply to Shamit Ganguly. It was a supplement to the kind of very fine work that he was developing uh, at that time. Uh, so I think I came to this initially thinking about how to write a paper trying to explain India-Pakistan relations. But a little earlier, a few years ago, three or four years ago, uh, I had written a paper on Narendra Modi's policy towards India and China in international affairs, where I noticed the kind of cyclicality of uh, India-China and India-Pakistan relations. So when I approached this paper for, for Steve Cohen, I thought I would go back to trying to explain the cycles of cooperation. So not explaining purely conflict and not focusing only on cooperation, but trying to do somewhat more difficult thing, which is try to uh, see whether there was a framework within which I could explain both. And it, if I looked at the landscape empirically, it just seemed like at least from 1996 onwards, uh, there was a kind of uh, a series of these cycles of attempted cooperation in the in the face of conflict, uh, sometimes quite uh, impressive results, 
moving uh, almost to, in one case, resolution of the Kashmir problem uh, during Manmohan Singh and Musharraf's time, uh, and then uh, seemingly inevitably a kind of collapse of negotiations and the collapse of cooperation. And then the picking up of the baton again. Uh, so the story begins here uh, empirically with uh, Nawaz Sharif and Vajpayee, then moves to a second uh, cycle of uh, Manmohan Singh and Musharraf, and then a third cycle of um, uh, Narendra Modi and uh, Nawaz Sharif again. I mean, there are other minor cycles. Uh, there's, a, there's a period when Manmohan Singh deals with Zardari, of course, but I don't deal with that in as much detail uh, for various reasons, partly reasons of space. But these are the three cycles that are quite interesting. And I think uh, one of the uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, positives I got from all of this was, you know, it forced me to go back to this period. Uh, I think for many of us already, going back to the mid 1990s seems like a very long time ago, uh, almost historically. Uh, and uh, it's become hazy. And it had become hazy for me, uh, even those people like Swarin and I lived uh, uh, through those days, uh, sitting in JNU in Delhi with breaking news almost every day on the India-Pakistan front. Um, so I, I think uh, I got a lot out of it in terms of reconstructing the story. Anyway, let me, uh, that's the broad motivation. How to explain both the continuous repeated drift on the part of very different leaderships. In Pakistan, you have Nawaz Sharif, uh, thought to be relatively soft on India. You have Musharraf, thought to be, of course, the architect of Kargil and hard uh, seeking cooperation. Zardari, relatively uh, neophyte politician, coming along in tragic circumstances and seeking cooperation. Perhaps even more interestingly, on the Indian side, uh, Vajpayee, uh, uh, you know, uh, moving repeatedly towards cooperation. Uh, succeeded by Manmohan, uh, supposedly, uh, you know, uh, not so strong a leader, uh, perhaps more dovish, but uh, moving ambitiously towards cooperation. And then um, and Narendra Modi, who a lot of people thought might be more uh, kind of tough on, on Pakistan, also doing uh, in three mini cycles, attempting to uh, uh, cooperate with Pakistan. And so across political lines, across civil military uh, sort of lines, as it were, um, in Pakistan, uh, you have over now, uh, this, I picked this 20 year period because it, it nicely captures the most important, I think, elements. And I would say by 2016, uh, India had kind of really moved away from uh, any more serious engagement with Pakistan. Although I recognize that even today, there are outreaches from the Modi government uh, to Islamabad. Okay, so uh, let me uh, just uh, begin by, uh, probably you're gonna see me look down a bit. I have my laptop in front. The paper is very detailed, but I'm not gonna go into all the episodes in fine detail uh, because uh, we just won't have enough time and we lose the, the big picture, I think, if I do. But I'll try and pick out uh, kind of some key empirical details. But I thought I'll begin with the abstract of the paper just to give you an idea of uh, what the broad argument is. And I'm just gonna read that out just to get it right, if you don't mind. So please bear with me. Um, the India-Pakistan relationship, often described as the most dangerous on earth, has experienced repeated cycles of cooperation and defection. Between 1996 and 2016, Delhi and Islamabad were involved in three cycles of cooperation and defection. The paper describes these cycles and attempts to explain the occurrence of cooperation and defection in terms of systemic and domestic factors. So two kind of categories of factors that uh, could explain uh, these, uh, this oscillation. The desire for military stability in the, uh, in the aftermath of the nuclear tests in 1998, demonstrating international responsibility after the nuclear tests, the search of South Asian leaders for international legitimacy and US diplomatic cajoling were the systemic forces encouraging cooperation. So four uh, kind of variables, if it were. Uh, domestically, an economic growth agenda and the worry over what I call chronic terrorism, a kind of general expectation, fear, and incidence of terrorism that sort of hangs in the air constantly, 
uh, was one of the domestic factors uh, that ironically, uh, I suggest, uh, actually uh, made India and Pakistan to reach out to each other. So, uh, but other domestic factors, uh, primarily divisions within ruling groups or governments, and the worry over, uh, 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 so, sorry, uh, other domestic factors, primary division within ruling groups meant that neither leadership could count on the other delivering on its key objectives. So you have two domestic factors, uh, the desire for an economic growth agenda and the worry over chronic terrorism sort of pushing uh, like the systemic forces, the two countries towards cooperation. But then you have divisions within the ruling coalition group or party uh, uh, that seems to push uh, them away at the last moment from cooperation. Um, for India, the crucial objective of negotiations was Pakistan reigning in cross-border terrorism. For Pakistan, it was India seriously engaging on a Kashmir settlement. Uh, and this will lead me to a larger confusion, which is in the international relations literature on the problem of commitments. When you don't see cooperation, even when there are systemic and other forces that seem to incline countries towards cooperation, uh, there's a literature that suggests that uh, there's always a commitment problem that seems to get in the way. And so I'll come back to that uh, later. So uh, some systemic forces that seem to continuously nudge and push and incline and provide incentives towards cooperation some domestic factors that also incline towards cooperation, but then this other domestic factor of divisions within the ruling group that incline the other way. Now, Swaran mentioned a very important point that I'm not actually going to deal with in the paper very much, which is this kind of larger issue of sort of identity. Uh, the idea of Pakistan, uh, what do Pakistanis think of when they think about themselves? And then of course we have the idea of India, how we think about ourselves, how those two big identity issues, in a way, is the, the bigger shadow behind everything. But I think that, in a way, that issue has been dealt with so much by historians and uh, social constructivists and so on that uh, I just leave that on the table as a background and as a given, but I don't uh, disentangle it in paper. Okay, so uh, what I want to do then is, with this background of what we're what is cooperation and defection, first of all? So I think I ought to be fairly clear. I mean, cooperation could be a range of things. And in this paper, it covers a, a range of things. It includes talks about talks. It includes confidence building and other stabilizing measures, military measures. Uh, it includes high level symmetry. Uh, it includes military restraint in the, in the face of provocation when crises actually occur. Uh, it, it includes signaling on of accommodation on core issues um, and actual attempts at dispute settlement. Yeah, the most ambitious form of cooperation. So what is defection? So in this paper, defection again can go from very kind of prosaic, ordinary things, uh, signaling defections from cooperation to much bigger things, uh, canceling meetings that were scheduled or expected, reneging on uh, going back on commitments and agreements that were already established, uh, reverting to hardline positions on core issues after signaling the opposite, um, series of public threats and accusations directed towards the other side, and of course, military actions all the way to war. Most famously, of course, Kargil was Pakistan's defection from the Lahore Agreement just a few months later. So that's a very big defection. But I use defection in this very broad sense from fairly ordinary, you know, kind of uh, uh, undiplomatic statements all the way to violence against the other side. Um, okay, so broadly what I'm suggesting is one set of systemic and domestic incentives pushed towards cooperation and one other set of domestic factors produced defection in the way that I've uh, defined those. Um, I think it's important to take, how do I develop that? I mean, I develop it by trying to fairly briefly but responsibly move through the literature, uh, the more conceptual literature on India-Pakistan relations, not the day-to-day -day writings about every meeting, every uh, you know, uh, war, every um, statement, uh, every act of cooperation or dissent or difference, but 
try to unpack the conceptual theoretical literature that, that has tried to give us an answer to, first of all, why conflict? And I think the two streams of thought, one I call the monadic, which sees the Pakistani state and really Pakistani strategic culture as the root cause of the problem. The second is a more dyadic explanation of conflict, which says there's something about the nature of the bilateral relationship, uh, Swaran called it structural, uh, that, that's what's causative. So it's not just Pakistan's strategic culture and its, its uh, view of how to deal with India, but there's something about how India and Pakistan you know, interact and what's the structural element between them that's at, at work. So amongst the monadic explanations, you go back to Shumit Ganguly's uh, work in his latter books. He has this idea in one book of the revisionist greedy state, a country that's not interested just in deterring India, but in actually making a land grab for say Kashmir or Siachen or you know, rivers or whatever. Uh, another explanation he had in, in another book is that uh, Chinese, uh, sorry, uh, Pakistani decision makers, particularly its military, has a sense of false optimism. So this is the idea that, oh, you know, the Indians can't fight, Hindus are not good fighters, uh, or that there are windows of opportunity militarily. India's weapon systems are not up to it. India is too defensive minded, et cetera. And Pakistan can, uh, are better fighters. They have a strategy, a winning strategy, and they should exploit that. Um, uh, TV Paul has argued that the way Pakistan manages the power asymmetry, it has a strategic culture of managing the uh, power asymmetry with asymmetric conflict. So it sends across raiders into India, or it uses uh, cross-border terrorists, uh, you know, uh, various kinds of asymmetric ways of, or it cultivates alliances uh, and hides behind nuclear weapons to push terrorism and so on into it. So it compensates for the power asymmetry with asymmetrical warf asymmetric warfare. Those are monadic explanations. The dyadic ones describe conflict in kind of the way that uh, Swaran was pointing to, the structural features of the relationship. The power asymmetry, which has always been there, has got worse. Religious animosity, some people have argued, um, and differences in, in more secular political values and identity. India's a democracy, Pakistan tends towards military dictatorships, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and Steve Cohen in his last book, tried to combine these dyadic explanations and said that, you know, there's a paired minority conflict. Both sides think that they're kind of the threatened weaker party. Uh, even though, I mean, India is of course much bigger in terms of population and land size and, and so on. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's a feeling in India that Pakistan can use other levers, terrorism or religious, uh, you know, kind of uh, symbolism and, and provocations, et cetera. Okay, so that's the dyadic explanation. Uh, then there's a cooperation literature, which is much smaller uh, as against the conflict literature. And here there aren't that many conceptual arguments or theoretical arguments, but uh, one argument that Schmidt himself made for a volume I edited many years ago uh, in the 1990s, where he did actually look at himself at all the cooperative acts between India and Pakistan. So it's a very interesting short paper. And he says, hey, look at, all these in India-Pakistan acts of cooperation, what we see there is international society. Now, it, uh, international diplomacy has a whole bag of tricks, practices that India and Pakistan have turned to. Confidence building measures, cultures of restraint in warfare, uh, uh, you know, a treatment of prisoners and war of war and so on, not bombing each other's cities, not bombing, uh, not harming civilians. I mean, this is before, the, this is in the early 1990s before much of the terrorism and so on began. And so he said, yeah, they, the influence of international society, because they're members of this larger international community, there's a kind of cosmopolitan set of practices that inclines them as good citizens of the world to uh, draw on those resources and move towards some forms of cooperation. Um, uh, Pallavi Raghavan, I don't know if you've seen her recent book, An uh, Animosity at Bay, tracks a particular period the, just after partition to about the mid-1950s, where she says that what inclines them to cooperation, uh, but also conflict, uh, and I'll come to that in a bit, is imperatives of dialogue uh, arising out of partition. 
So the various things that developed out of partition caused them to, even as they were at loggerheads, they were forced to deal with it for their own sense, sense of administrative propriety, uh, you know, establishing that government uh, and so on, and dealing with, uh, you know, the backwash of uh, partition. Uh, so things like minority rights or uh, resettlement of refugees or engaging on the issue of, uh, you know, uh, little uh, bits of territory that got uh, stuck, uh, enclaves of territory that got stuck on both sides, uh, uh, families that were uh, separated and uh, refugee property settlements, things like that repeatedly caused them to, uh, to cooperate. Um, and then uh, my student, Ashutosh Mishra, my first student at PhD, uh, PhD student at uh, JNU, wrote a, a thesis, and it's now a book, on, uh, you know, there are certain times when uh, the uh, conflicts between them became ripe for resolution. So there's a whole literature in negotiation theory on when is it that two states can uh, uh, spot a moment which is ripe when their conflict is ripe for resolution. And he drew on this conflict resolution negotiation literature to show that they were quite shrewd. So the uh, possible resolution of Siachen in the 90s, Sir Creek, uh, also, of course, the run of Kutch, which was adjudicated uh, by reference to uh, you know, uh, international mediation, uh, and so on. So he looked at five cases and through the lens of negotiation theory. Um, and then lastly, uh, more recently, uh, the presence of nuclear weapons itself, which has caused a certain uh, inclination towards cooperation because they're such terrible weapons. And even if you're two conflicting parties, just like the Americans and the Soviets in the Cold War, they had to minimally work out some forms of understanding so that it didn't blow up into nuclear war. And so India and Pakistan, uh, as rational actors, themselves have uh, uh, come to that understanding clearly from the beginning and uh, tried to cooperate insofar as they've tried to stabilize their military relationship and prevent escalation to uh, nuclear war. So I think both these sets of literatures are insightful, the conflict literature, monadic and dyadic, but also this cooperative literature, but they don't quite explain why there are cycles of repeated cooperation and then collapse into defection. Uh, and yet this empirical fact has been noticed. Sham Saran in his book, uh, you know, How India Sees the World, uh, described India-Pakistan relations in terms of dialogue, disruption, dialogue, and he said, which repeats itself in quote unquote, endless cycles. Amongst academics, uh, uh, the Indian American Ashley Tellis noted, the cycle of interrupted diplomatic engagement and the exchange of military threats uh, there's a cycle of a repeated like this. And again, I mentioned Pallavi Raghavan. Uh, I mean, there are others who notice it, Shankar Menon, former national security advisor, as also Pallavi's father, uh, Manu Raghavan, who was high commissioner in Pakistan, have also noticed this kind of cycle. But Pallavi says uh, that while India and Pakistan have had wars and skirmishes and diplomatic spats and uh, do a lot of kind of uh, allocation to defense, she says, but yet, quote unquote, the dialogue process moves along in fits and starts. Yeah. So it's been noticed. So what accounts for these fits and starts? Is there anyone who's really tried to explain it? I mean, one explanation, very conventional one in a way, is terrorism accounts for it. But that explains why the defection occurs, but it doesn't quite address the issue of um, the cooperation. Uh, Manu Raghavan, in his recent book on India, Pakistan, The People Next Door, uh, traces it to a kind of uh, division in every country, but, uh, particularly, he says, in Pakistan, between uh, doves and hawks. So when the doves are in relative ascendance or positions of influence in Pakistan, there's kind of an inclination towards cooperation. But in the shadow are always the hawks looking to, for the first opportunity, to un unravel it. Likewise, uh, you know, uh, uh, if the hawks are in the ascendant, when their policies don't seem to bring India to the uh, negotiating table, then the doves say, well, look, your policies didn't work. Let's try negotiating with India instead. So there's this kind of, he says, they, by turn, they fade in importance, hawks. Pallavi says again that this 
negotiation on administrative and legal matters arising from partition pushed them towards cooperation, but it also caused conflict because how they looked at refugees, how they dealt with uh, the property issues, how they looked at divided families, how they looked at enclaves of territoriality that were stuck after the lines were drawn for partition, uh, often they differed a lot on this. And of course, with respect to minority rights. All right, so, and finally, Rajesh Basroor, uh, my colleague here in Singapore at Nanyang Technological University, gets us towards a kind of explanation that I favor in this paper, where he, in an interesting paper in the Oxford Handbook of uh, Indian Foreign Policy, has a piece where he attributes cooperation and conflict to systemic and domestic factors. So he says the systemic factors are nuclear weaponization, economic globalization that encourage cooperation. On the other hand, internal political differences can lead to defection. Uh, and he touches on what Swaran did, that the kind of the idea of Pakistan, the idea of India constantly seem to intrude as well. Uh, but there's a tendency for what uh, is known in the literature as outbidding in this situation, which is internally, because there are contending forces, it pays one political party or group to do so-called outbidding, which is be more nationalist than the government in power or your opponent. So whether it's the Congress or the BJP, each wants to be more nationalist than the other, and you're seeing it today, right, on the uh, India-China issue probably. Uh, if you've been watching some of the videos of uh, Rahul Gandhi uh, recently, I mean, in a way, he's, he's, uh, he's uh, claiming to be even more nationalist than, than the government on the issue. So that's sort of outbidding. Um, putting all these together, the conflict literature, the cooperation literature, and then this, the, this literature that tries to get the cyclicality, uh, I've come out with, I tried to synthesize them in the way that I described earlier, so I'm not going to say it again, but I pay attention to the effects of nuclear weaponization, to the opportunities of economic cooperation in a globalizing world, and to great power diplomacy, primarily American diplomacy directed towards uh, the subcontinent. Um, trying to get you know the two sides to to cooperate, and then of course, what Rajesh I think Basrur missed was that, that he sees the systemic factors as all inclining to India and Pakistan towards cooperation, but I think we have to admit that there are other system systemic factors that might in fact divide India and Pakistan, and so nuclear weaponization seems to play both ways. We know that. Uh, it has created a shield for Pakistan uh, under which it has pushed asymmetric conflict, cross-border terrorism, or in, in Kargil, the intrusion of its own military forces uh, up to a point. So, you know, I mean, I think systemic forces, there's some systemic forces that seem to push for cooperation. And that same systemic force that makes India and Pakistan sensitive to escalation also is the same factor that allows Pakistan to cause India all this kind of trouble over terrorism. Um, at the same time, you know, on India's side, uh, gradually we've come to a point of view that uh, nuclear weaponization could play into our hands. And the cold start doctrine that you probably all read about is the Indian argument that India, in fact, can also use the fear of escalation to, you know, uh, hit back at Pakistan. So, this suggests that you know, nuclear weaponization is a systemic factor that has, can cut both ways. All right. Um, and as, as I say, domestic political factors, I won't go over them again, uh, but they, they tend to cut both ways as well. And so the, the paper seems to ask, does ask, is how did these actually affect these different cycles and how, can they account for it? Now, I mean, I just want to make two points before I get to the three cases quickly and then go to my conclusion. Um, I mean, you could argue, first of all, well, first of all, uh, I base a lot of my empirics, obviously, on as much as possible on the main actors themselves and their reminiscences. Advani's book, uh, Musharraf's bio, uh, autobiography, uh, Pakistani Foreign Minister Kasuri's massive volume, uh, which is rather, actually a rather readable book. Uh, Jaswan Singh's uh, India at Risk book, uh, others who were either close to the action or uh, Sanjay Baru's book, The Accidental Prime Minister. You know, so, I mean, Manmohan hasn't written about uh, his own uh, time, 
but you know you get an insight from a basrur into these episodes and so on so I, i'm not going to quote everyone i i use but so not perfect but the best i could do with the information that's out there which is i think all that's all we can do as academics and second i mean I, you have there is an alternative explanation of india pakistan dynamics uh, in a way particularly on the cooperative side which is that all the cooperative uh, acts are just performances uh, particularly playing to an international sometimes to a domestic audience uh, to sort of show that you know indians and pakistanis are making an effort and keeping you know international concerns at bay uh, likewise you know the defections are equally cynical so as i said you know if you want to paint yourself as more nationalist than the other group you say oh no 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 i mean i'm not interested in cooperation the other side is uh, horrible and and so you could say everything is it's just as we say in india shoshagiri it's just a a lot of kind of hand waving uh, and it wasn't genuine but i think looking at all these uh, 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 first hand or near first hand accounts that's not the feel you get from the literature you do get a sense that whether we like mushara for nawaz sharif or or uh, you know um uh, other pakistani players or whether we like uh, indian leaders if you're a pakistani um they at moments they were genuine about seeking cooperation and trying to solve the problem and if they didn't manage it i mean i, I wouldn't be cynical about it i think it failed because it's these are difficult problems to to to, to solve and there were genuine internal political issues that they couldn't quite uh come to grips with okay i mean let's look at these uh, three cases so the first one is vajpay sharif musharraf lahore then the kargil defection and then agra and then the collapse of tok in agra so here you have kind of two cycles right there um and if you remember these uh, these cases um it, it sort of started actually the first one in 1996 with nawaz sharif musingly saying during his election campaign Uh, that if he was re-elected, he would re uh, he would open negotiations on Kashmir with India and improve relations. And next year, the six plus two dialogue uh, got going, and that six plus two dialogue then later became the comprehensive dialogue, and in a way, it's still there. Um, then, after the nuclear test of 1998, uh, Vajpayee suggested uh, that the two leaders meet at the, the United Gen uh, Nations General Assembly in September of that year. so you know both sent out signals uh, saying that we want to try and do something and so they agreed uh, and uh, of course we know that uh, out of that summit uh, vajpay then went on the inaugural bus to lahore uh, to uh, between amritsar and lahore went to to pakistan uh, of course uh, there's a story there to be told about all the uh, after the two leaders committing to the process you know once the bureaucracies got hold of it on both sides it nearly fell apart and vajpay uh, uh sharif telephone vajpay rather unhappy that it wasn't moving and um they agreed that in order to circumvent the bureaucracy uh sharif would give an interview to shekhar gupta of the indian express and vajpay agreed to this and sharif uh, kept his word and he invited vajpay publicly in that interview you can get hold of it and as soon as he did the invitation vajpay i think was interacting with some journalists maybe in lucknow if i remember or kanpur he publicly accepted the invitation right um and the summit was uh, uh, third week of feb and you remember they signed the lahore declaration and i won't describe it but it was quite a far ranging kind of it didn't solve kashmir but there were cbms and an awareness of nuclear weapons uh vajpay did some very symbolic things like go to the minar of pakistan Uh, and so on and wrote a comment in the book that was much appreciated there uh, but very importantly this is where the back channel began uh, between india and pakistan uh, and in the back channel they agreed to discuss kashmir even though that was not in the lahore agreement and already some discussions had begun on uh, would a solution be along the line of control or was would it have to be something more than that um anyway weeks later we all know it all collapsed the first defection was kargil um but um and so what accounts for this first cycle what led sharif and vajpay to cooperate and then 
well, we know what led to its uh, collapse, but we need to look a little bit at why Musharraf did it. Uh, so here is where the systemic and domestic factors led or pushed them to cooperate. I mean, first, clearly after the 1998 tests, I mean, Sharif had already opened up before the tests, hinting that he wanted to, to, to cooperate. Vajpayee was in the mood. Uh, but the 1998 test really was a kind of systemic factor. I mean, there's a lot of international blowback against both countries. Um, you know, um, you may remember that just hours after the test, the Pakistanis called in the Indian High Commissioner uh, in Islamabad and said, hey, we've heard that India is going to attack us, uh, attack our nuclear installations, and if you do so, uh, you know, we're going to be at war. So Vajpayee, with the international background and this little bit of Pakistani kind of alarmist behavior, he thought that uh, a meeting to cool off tempers and to show the world that both countries were responsible was important. And India's high commissioner at the time was uh, Parthasarthi, and he has written, uh, this was Vajpayee's thinking, and I quote Parthasarthi, we had to get rid of that international pressure. And what better way to tell the world, okay, I'm going to meet Nawaz. We don't need all the international mediation. We will manage our affairs with Pakistan. This is G. Parthasati trying to tell us what Vajpayee's thinking was communicated to him as high commissioner. Sharif felt the international pressure too, but he had another motivation, which was more domestic and economic. I mean, we all know he's always wanted trade and better relations with India on that. Uh, and so he came at it also from that perspective, which India didn't have so much uh, at the time. But he had it not just because he wanted to improve economic ties, you know, he's an industrialist and he has his own interests, but he also thought that it would perhaps loosen the grip of the military, that his party could bring, you know, normalcy with India, economic ties would grow, there would be more welfare and people would be grateful to his party and that would put the military more and more in its place. Um, in an interview with Shekhar Gupta, he, he said in, in that same interview, uh, he said that, uh, you know, uh, economic interactions were, were vital, as were, you know, understandings over Kashmir and nuclear issues. And quote, unquote, I'd like to say, and he's addressing Vajpayee, Vajpayee Saab, let's solve the Kashmir problem. Let's solve the other problems so that we can move ahead like the rest of the world, meaning like the rest of the world has more normal economic and other interaction, which India has always advocated, by the way. Yeah. See, there are such great prospects for our cooperation, he said. Uh, in business and investment, you are busy making weapons, meaning you and us, uh, that is Pakistan, and so are we, because we are competing against each other, some rivalry this is, exclamation mark. Okay, that gives you a flavor of the systemic and the more domestic on the Pakistani side particularly. Okay, given these systemi systemic and domestic factors for cooperation, why did, why did uh, Kargil happen? I mean, Kargil was planned way before Kargil. So there's evidence that it may have been planned as early as 1986 by a coterie of military leaders uh, who wanted revenge, who didn't like what was happening in, um, in uh, Siachen. Um, and, but it was formally approved by Musharraf in January and Mar between January and March 1999. That is just as the summit was happening and so on. They seemingly briefed Nawaz Sharif, it's never been very clear whether he really understood what it was all about. But why did they do it? This is hazy and there are different views. There's some very interesting Pakistani writings now, uh, particularly the book by uh, Nasim Zera, uh, who's unpacked a lot of it, rather frankly, I must say. Uh, but one of the items, certainly, apart from trying to put a lot of pressure on Siachen, perhaps even cutting off the Indian military from certain parts of Kashmir, uh, they wanted to torpedo Sharif's engagement with India and his peace efforts. So if you read Musharraf, he's quite frank about it, but more so are uh, Nasim Zera, who wrote this uh, very big book on Pakistani thinking on it. It's also substantiated by Owen Bennett Jones, uh, the uh, uh, British journalist in his book, and Shamit Ganguly also uh, presents information on, on, on that. Um, so they wanted to, here's a domestic factor then for that is cutting the other way, uh, which is that the difference between the ruling group, which I had flagged earlier between Nawaz Sharif, who's pro some sort of cooperation, and then the military, which is against it at this point, causes it to, causes the defection. 
And clearly, Pakistan uh, Prime Minister was not able to control his military. Okay. After this, I mean, Musharraf overthrows Sharif and he comes to power. Uh, and despite the fact that he's the guy who led us into war, uh, by 2000, the two governments are trying to resurrect cooperation again. Uh, in July 2000, uh, the Hezbollah Mujahideen from Pakistan offers Delhi a ceasefire. This was withdrawn in a couple of weeks, but Vajpayee reciprocates with a six month sort of unilateral ceasefire between November 2000 and May 2001. Uh, in January 2001, Pakistan provides humanitarian supplies uh, to uh, India in Bhuj, in Gujarat, after a phone call from Musharraf. And on 24th of May, finally, Vajpayee invites Musharraf to Agra to, um, you know, uh, I remember I, NDTV got me to go to Agra and comment and so on. It was, a, a, a unfortunately, a summit failed. Uh, in, in mid-July. Uh, and soon after, terrorists attacked the Kashmir legislature in October and the Indian parliament, of course, in uh, December. Vajpayee ordered the, the uh, military mobilization of Parakram, which led to a seven-month confrontation. So you have, again, an act of cooperation, the summit, and then a defection, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, the terrorist attacks, and then the military mobilization. So again, why did India and Pakistan seek to cooperate just two months after uh, uh, this uh, 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 about uh, war? Well, first, the broad systemic factors I mentioned earlier to demonstrate a degree of international responsibility uh, continue to operate. And indeed, Kargil, in a way, had reinforced that so after nuclearization and the international community was pointing fingers at the two countries and saying, you know, you guys, uh, there won't be stability and so on. Uh, then after Kargil, there was even more of that worry, primarily uh, because of Pakistan's behavior. Uh, but Advani, uh, and you read his book, uh, he is the one who nudged Vajpayee to hold the Agra summit. Uh, and he reasoned that Musharraf wanted a meeting to end Pakistan's isolation after Kargil. And India needed to test the mind of this new leader. But most importantly, uh, he said that India would gain internationally by reaching out to the adversary. And this is footnoted uh, to, uh, uh, to Jaswant Singh, who remembers uh, these comments. Um, Musharraf, who had led Pakistan into war, also understood that he was under great pressure to, more so than India, to reassure the international community. Uh, even China, if you remember in Kargil, had not stood with Pakistan, telling uh, you know, uh, Nawaz Sharif and the Pakistani leadership that they had to do something to, uh, to keep things under control and, and come out of, of the war. Um, okay, for India, beyond the systemic factor of you know, trying to uh, show that you know nuclear weapons could be handled uh, despite the war. Uh, the terrorism in Kashmir played a part. Now here is we always think terrorism leads to the breakdown of cooperation with Pakistan, but just one thing, uh, who also had pleaded with Vajpayee to invite Musharraf to Agra, uh, he recollects that uh, the Kashmir militants' response to the ceasefire, he says, had been disappointing. If so, he reasons that working with Pakistan to curb terrorism and perhaps even strike a deal on Kashmir uh, was the alternative. I mean, it wasn't an alternative simply to do counterinsurgency and try and t talk to you know, the Hurriyat or whoever it was in Kashmir. You couldn't escape the Pakistan factor, he felt. Musharraf too had domestic motives for uh, you know, uh, relating to terrorism. Uh, because after 9-11, Pakistan-based terrorism, uh, uh, you know, was becoming a, a, a global issue and he was under a lot of pressure. And this is what he says. When he came into power after deposing Nawaz Sharif, he says, my focus was mainly on internal consolidation and socioeconomic uplift. In relation to India, he says, the Indo-Pakistan dispute is a hindrance to socioeconomic cooperation and development. There is no military solution to our problems. The way forward is through diplomacy. Uh, we have to turn over a new leaf. And so he says, I picked up the phone and in January to ask uh, India if, they, if I could help in Bhuj. 
Okay, so why did, these were the factors for cooperation, why did it fail? Essentially, the two sides were unable to agree. If you go back and now look at Advani and Jaswan Singh, particularly why they, you know, the, they said no to a Musharraf a, a, and a deal at Agra, basically it boiled down to the fact that uh, Musharraf insisted on the centrality of Kashmir and he was very uh, reluctant to allow terrorism. The earlier agreements uh, at Lahore and, and, uh, and uh, at Simla to feature in the joint statement uh, and the Indians didn't buy it. They wanted, uh, they were willing to have, especially Vajpayee, uh, it seems, were willing to have, uh, to admit that negotiations on Kashmir were important, but they definitely wanted a very strong statement also on terrorism. Uh, so in the end, even though, you know, uh, they had reached out and both sides had made an effort. I mean, Musharraf uh, was uh, rather bombastic when he came. There was that famous session with the media, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there were some uh, not very uh, sensible statements made on both sides, but at the end of the day, Musharraf, in a way, pushed uh, the terrorism issue to the side, and the Indian side just didn't buy it. And this, you know, it speaks to a very important issue, which comes back. Uh, we'll come back to haunt India and Pakistan again uh, when Manmohan Singh and Musharraf come, nearly come to a deal. Okay, so let's go on to that. Between 2004 and seven. Uh, we know now that the two countries nearly struck a deal on Kashmir. Whether it would really have worked, whether the military in Pakistan would have actually carried it through, uh, whether on the Indian side there would have been enough political support domestically for Manmohan, who was in a coalition government, to actually give uh, effect to it, uh, we don't know. Those are the what-ifs of history, but the deal in, in the end didn't actually quite happen. But the story is an interesting one. And again, it's worth asking why they, again, after the collapse at Agra, uh, and uh, after all, Musharraf, who was involved in that collapse, is still there. And now Manmohan tries his luck uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, Musharraf. So this time, uh, you know, in 1996, in a way, Nawaz Sharif had started the first inkling of cooperation, or the first push, <clears throat> and Bajpai really took it up. <clears throat> and then Vajpayee initiated it after, uh, uh, after Kargil. This time Manmohan, <clears throat> in a way, really starts it. In May of 2004, he suggests that soft, he muses in a sort of public, in an interview, I think, with uh, Jonathan Power, the American, he says, you know, soft borders might be part of this uh, Kashmir solution. Um, and then he, like Vajpayee meeting Nawar Sharif, he meets Musharraf in New York again at the UNGA. And the back channel is kept alive. Uh, Musharraf in his UNGA speech deliberately omits to mention uh, the Kashmir dispute. Manmohan in turn, in his uh, speech uh, at the UN, pledges to continue bilateral negotiations. And again, the two leaders meet face to face afterwards and talk about CBMs and they address a joint press conference uh, fairly spontaneously. <clears throat> the following month, Musharraf again, he suggests that a plebiscite is no longer the way forward in Kashmir. So he first doesn't mention in his speech in the UN Kashmir, then he says he dismisses the plebiscite. Uh, and he says, no, let's do something else. Delhi and Islamabad should identify regions on both sides of the LOC that could be demilitarized. And maybe these regions could be given independence and put under some sort of joint India-Pakistan control or even the UN. In response, in November 04, Manmohan reduces troops in the state and offers to reopen talks with separatists in, on the Indian side. You remember 2005, the bus service finally begins between the two Kashmiri capitals, if I could call it that. In April uh, of 05, Musharraf invites himself to an India-Pakistan cricket match in Delhi. Uh, and then a third round of Kashmir uh, composite dialogue occurs. India further reduces troops, uh, offers Pakistan a treaty of friendship, security, and, and so on, which it has done many times in the past. Uh, Pakistan is a bit tough on it, says no, Kashmir is a central issue, but they still agree to move ahead out of these composite dialogue talks. They agree to more nuclear CBMs and crucially to resolving Siachen and Sir Creek, which they nearly solved in 1993-94 uh, when 
when uh, Narasimha Rao was at the helm. Okay, in 06, Manmohan and Musharraf meet in Havana, the non-aligned summit, where they endorsed the progress that back channel and so on had, uh, and joint mechanism and so on had, had made, and agreed to speed up Siachin and Sir Creek solution. Musharraf now outlines his famous four points, which I, I won't go over because they're, they're probably quite familiar to you, and I, I mentioned some of it already. And in March 07, the Composite Dialogue uh, discusses the demilitarization of Kashmir, a Siachin deal, liberalization of visas, and reputedly, they came to a very close to a Kashmir settlement. Drawing on Musharraf's point, but, and Manmohan's point about soft borders, talking about local self-government, joint governance between the two halves, but with defense and foreign policy in, in, in the two, in Indian and Pakistani hands, and some phasing out of, of you know, troops from both sides. Uh, but Manmohan made very clear, quote unquote, no question of redrawing boundaries, he said. However, just weeks later, when it looked like it was within their grasp, uh, it had all collapsed. And in, you remember in August 08, Musharraf was basically booted out of office. And that was the end of, of that. So why did the two sides move to this intense and really ambitious process of cooperation? Why did it fail uh, to produce really a, 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 the big agreement? Again, a combination of systemic and domestic factors seem to push towards negotiation. At the systemic level, again, this issue of nuclear weapons was around. Uh, that there simply could not be constant kind of asymmetric conflict coming from Pakistan, and then the temptation of escalation or retaliation, and who knows where it would go. Uh, India, uh, you remember looking back on the military mobilization, Parakram and so on, of 0102, uh, had drawn the lesson that it was very mixed. Yeah, Musharraf had gone on TV to say he would control terrorism, uh, but you know, that soon petered out. Uh, but importantly, India had lost a lot of men and material without a single shot being fired. So you remember that, I mean, several hundred Indian soldiers were hurt or killed by landmines blowing up and, you know, ammunition being mishandled, uh, tanks and so on, you know, in the desert heat being damaged while they were waiting to do something. On the Pakistani side, their lessons were that, well, Cargill had not worked uh, and it had led to you know, uh, international criticism and isolation. And nor had terrorism worked. India was still in, in control of Kashmir. Uh, and in fact, you know, uh, India's image was better now as a result of Pakistani behavior in Kashmir and the incidence of, of terrorism. So Pakistan didn't seem to have profited from uh, its strategies uh, either. Um, I mean, here are some uh, uh, quite interesting, I mean, a rather interesting Kashmir, a uh, quote from uh, the Pakistani foreign minister under Musharraf, uh, he, he writes, Pakistan had become a nuclear power, war was no longer an option. And then he speaks, he recounts a, a meeting with Pakistani generals, the corps commanders around Musharraf. And he says, put your hand uh, here on your heart and tell me that Kashmir will gain freedom without an understanding from India. And apparently he says, they all assented. They all agreed that uh, they could not free Kashmir uh, if that was their ambition without Indian cooperation or could not, you know, as it were, deliver uh, uh, the safety of Kashmiri people uh, without in India's collaboration. So, you know, both their strategies hadn't worked, going to war or pushing asymmetric conflict. So that was, you know, uh, one sort of systemic factor that the kind of nuclear overhang for India, it didn't want, you know, it, it had tried a uh, kind of uh, a cold start like policy of uh, coercive diplomacy, hadn't really worked against Pakistani terrorism very much. And the Pakistanis thought that their use of force and asymmetric conflict protected by nuclear weapons hadn't worked either. But a second systemic factor nudging the two sides was US diplomatic kind of cajoling from about the Cargill uh, period onwards. So I'm not going to go through all of that, but the Americans obviously were worried about escalation and so on and so forth. Um, and they, they were in discussion with both sides for things that both sides wanted. 
So India, US were doing next steps in strategic partnership, 2004 accord, and of course, more famously, the nuclear accord, which uh, came about one, two, three civilian nuclear agreement in 2005. So the Americans were kind of a little conjecture here, but using that to get India to edge towards Manmohan to go back to negotiations constantly. In Pakistan's case, Washington was holding discussions on declaring Pakistan a major non-NATO ally and resuming supplies of F-16 aircraft that had been embargoed for a long time. I don't know if any of you remember that. And the Pakistanis were hoping for a parallel nuclear deal with the Americans, which the Americans were hesitating over, obviously, and in the end said no. But I think it's fair to say that both Delhi and Islamabad couldn't be unaware that if they wanted the nuclear deal, if they wanted a certain kind of partnership with the Americans on various issues, that if the Americans were saying, look, you've got to also talk to each other, otherwise we won't be able to pass this in the US Congress. Nuclear deal, resumption of F-16 to Pakistan, etc. You know, I mean, there was a reason that India had to, and Pakistan had to kind of show some progress uh, in discussions uh, with each other. Otherwise, the deals they wanted perhaps would not be sellable back in Washington to US Congress. Okay, third, here's a domestic push towards cooperation, uh, the economic agenda. Uh, uh, look at what uh, Sanjay Baru uh, talks about in terms of Manmohan's thinking on relations with Pakistan. And I quote Baru, uh, who was the media advisor, uh, quote unquote, Dr. Manmohan Singh was convinced that destiny was in India's side and India's rise of the world's largest democracy and an economic power would only be slowed down by an unsettled neighborhood. In Pakistan too, there was thinking on new economic growth and links to geopolitics. So if India, Pakistan was in a hole, if it could improve its economic prospects, it would also have an impact on its geopolitics. India hoped its economic reforms and dramatic growth would put it in the big league and allow it to jump out of South Asia and play a bigger role. Pakistan too had somewhat similar thoughts. Here's Musharraf in his memoirs. Uh, he says, when I took power, Pakistan stood at the brink of being declared a failed state, a defaulted state, or even a terrorist state. The 21st century, he said, will be driven by geoeconomics more than by geostrategy or geopolitics. Journalist Steve, Steve Call, the American, who wrote that famous piece on the back channel in the New Yorker, has some really interesting quotes. I mean, I, I take them to be true and or correct. I check them against Kasuri's account. Uh, who he had interviewed and they seemed to check out. So, I mean, for what it's worth. Call uh, talks about uh, Musharraf addressing his senior generals and he writes, Musharraf talked about how a peace settlement might produce economic benefits that could strengthen Pakistan and its military. The army had a 15 year development plan. The generals knew that the plan would be difficult to pay without rapid growth. Kasuri writes, I was happy to see how much focus there was on the economy amongst the army officers. Mahmoud Durrani, a retired general and Pakistan's ambassador in Washington, characterized this thinking of senior officers in the following words. Can my economy, Pakistan, support me? These are the generals. Can my foreign policy support me, the army? What does the world think of us? Kasuri's chief of staff, uh, uh, another official, attests to the changing attitude in Pakistan, quote unquote, the feeling that the world is changing and that we in Pakistan have to change. Okay, so the domestic economic agenda, especially again for Pakistan, uh, India was already embarked on pretty robust growth, but in both sides was. Lastly, the specter of what I call chronic terrorism in India and Pakistan encouraged diplomatic engagement. Not the particular episodes, you know, Pathan Court, Uri, attack on parliament, those obviously uh, were, caused a lot of turbulence. But the general expectation and fear that there would be terrorism and that th this was you know, hard to control and it needed the two sides to come together, ironically. Uh, and that it couldn't really be dealt with by just counter-terrorism operations. Uh, so there was that feeling in India um, and in Pakistan, it, perhaps it was even more dramatic. Uh, so uh, former Pakistan ambassador to the US, Maliha Lodi, talks about the attacks on Musharraf you know, he was twice attacked within months by 
terrorist within Pakistan nearly lost his life. In fact, in one case, he was saved by India because the Indian intelligence had got hold of the uh, information about the attack and, and let him know about it. But they went ahead with the, the, uh, his trip so that they could try and smoke out uh, who had to, going to attack Musharraf. But anyway, this is what Malia Lodi says. This, the attacks, is what turns Musharraf decisively. Religious radicalism, and now this is what I write, that fed off various causes, including hatred of India and resentment over Kashmir, was therefore not just Delhi's problem to deal with it after these assassination attempts and the boiling internal problems of Pakistan. To deal with it required Islamabad to reduce tensions with India so as to reduce support for extremism. So these are the four factors, systemic and domestic, that seem to push them towards uh, uh, you know, uh, cooperation. Why did cooperation fail? Um, now I'm a bit aware of time, so maybe what I'll do is I'll, uh, after this one, go to my conclusion and I'll leave out the Modi period. Maybe I can do the three cycles of Modi in the Q&A and just to illustrate the point, although I'd say maybe a few things about that. Is that okay, is that, is, uh, given the time? Swaran, would that be okay? I think that's fine. Uh, we have already so many requests uh, for questions. Yeah. Uh, so if so I think many... I'll, 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 I'll just finish this one and then uh, very quickly give you a little flavor of the Modi period. Uh, it ended quicker and uh, it, 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 the analysis is not very different, although there's, there are little uh, nuances that are important. So why do cooperation fail? I mean, basically, we go back to the Agra summit. At the end of the day, you know, uh, Manmohan, uh, first of all, faced domestic problems. Uh, uh, Baru records that he was not worried, Manmohan, about the opposition from BJP. He was worried about his colleagues at the senior most level in the Congress party. So, A.K. Antony, Pranam Mukherjee, Shivraj Patil, at various moments were not enthusiastic about a deal with the Pakistanis. They were joined by Chief of Army J.J. Singh and by M.K. Narayanan, who was National Security Advisor. All four of these, uh, less so Pranam Mukherjee, to some extent, but four of the others were opposed to the Siachin Accord and probably opposed to the larger Kashmir deal that was being proposed. Uh, there was support for normalizing relations with Pakistan, but probably not the four-part formula that I talk about. And Foreign Secretary Shamsaran, who I know there's been some commentary now on the whole issue of a deal on Siachin recently, uh, he records, there's no doubt in my mind, he was foreign secretary at that, that time, that any understanding on Kashmir had to be part and parcel of a larger peace process, i.e. including terrorism. So here again is that doubt in the Indian side that you know, they might negotiate on Kashmir and get a deal, but would they get satisfaction on terrorism? On the Pakistani side, domestically, it just blew up. He mishandled his uh, army commanders when he uh, uh, you know, push the militant, anti-militant operations in Fatah. He didn't take them into account uh, enough. The Lal Masjid episode occurred where all these, uh, the military operations against uh, them caused a lot of deaths. He took on the Supreme Court of Pakistan and the lawyers, and all this blew up. Uh, in addition, Nawab Bukti, the Baluch leader, was killed uh, by the army, so there was a lot of trouble there. And then, of course, Benazir Bhutto's assassination was people pointed the finger at Musharraf. And by August 2008, he had to resign and he couldn't carry the deal through. Uh, so, uh, although after that, uh, when Mohan tried with Zardari, I mean, too much, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, damage had been done. Uh, very quickly, uh, Modi and Sharif, I mean, there are three episodes, uh, just very quickly. Uh, the first was right when Modi uh, took office. You remember he invited Sharif to the inauguration, Sharif played along, he, he didn't mention Kashmir when he was there. When he went back to Islamabad, he got quite a lot of criticism for not doing so. Um, but it allowed Modi to then say, you know, the foreign secretaries would meet in talks about talks in, in August of that year, this is 2014. Uh, but suddenly it was called off because uh, the Pakistani High Commissioner in Delhi uh, invited the Hurriyat to a, a party he was giving India had gone along with this idea for some years, 
but uh, Modi uh, and his uh, government decided that they weren't comfortable with that. So they called off the, the talks. Uh, so that's one little mini cycle that occurred very quickly, two, three months and it was, it collapsed. But a second cooperation began almost immediately. March, 2015, foreign secretaries met finally in Islamabad. Modi and Sharif met, you remember, at Ufa, at the Shanghai Cooperation Summit in, in July. And importantly, they said, we will discuss all outstanding issues. Did that not mean Kashmir as well? So in a way, it seemed like, but they would also meet, and the NSAs would talk about terrorism, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, and Modi would perhaps attend the SARC summit later in Islamabad in 2015. But then Sharif defects. He goes back from Ufa and he says, under criticism for not raising Kashmir again, uh, he now says, oh, Kashmir has to be under discussion. Uh, and that uh, on his NSA, when it, he met the Indian NSA in Delhi, would meet the Hurriyat, which they, he knew that Modi was allergic to. And finally, Pakistan canceled the talks, although India was already veering towards canceling. So that's, and then the terrorists struck after the cancellation of these talks. This is important. We always think terrorism ended the problem but the terrorists struck Gurdaspur on the 27th of July and Udhampur in another attack on the 5th of August, but Sharif had already called off the, the talks. Let's see. The third cooperation cycle began with the Modi Sharif meeting at the uh, Paris Climate Change uh, Summit in November 2015, just months later. You know? So you can see how they constantly, where they announce a resumption of dialogue, a week later the NSAs meet in Bangkok, uh, two days later, uh, you know, um, uh, Sushma Suraj is in, in, in Islamabad uh, at the heart of Asia conference being organized there. And they decide that the composite dialogue now will be called the comprehensive dialogue. Uh, same set of subjects, basically. And uh, on Christmas Day, 25th of December, Modi coming back from Afghanistan suddenly drops in on Lahore uh, on uh, Nawaz Sharif. You know, so quite dramatic uh, what Modi does. And they agree that foreign secretaries will meet, et cetera. Before they can meet, Pathan Court occurs. But note, people expected that everything will collapse, but Delhi exercises restraint. In spite of the provocation, it organizes a GIT, Joint Investigation uh, Team with Pakistan. The Pakistanis come. Uh, in the meantime, by the way, in March 2016, Pakistan informs India of a possible terror attack in Gujarat uh, at, on the occasion of Shivratri and it's headed off. But anyway, uh, Delhi signals cooperation 23rd of March, uh, allows the separatist Hurriyats to meet the Pakistani High Commissioner. This is under Modi, earlier he had said no. GIT visit 27th of March in Pathan court, the Pakistanis come there. Again, the Pakistanis defect. As soon as the GIT goes back, when the Indian team is supposed to go to Pakistan in pursuance of the second meeting of the GIT, uh, Pakistan says no, Pathan court, the meeting of the GIT in Pathan court was stage managed by India, quote unquote. Uh, the Indians were not sincere uh, and they canceled the comprehensive dialogue. And then the Uri attack occurs in September. Uh, and then of course, India does the uh, famous surgical strike on 28th of September. And that's pretty much the end of, the, of that in Modi's first term, the attempts to. I wouldn't be belabor the point again, the systemic factors sort of operate. Uh, India acknowledges in one of Sushma Swaraj's key statements that violence cannot solve the problem on either side. The US again tries to nudge both sides towards some talks. Uh, you know, um, uh, again, uh, Modi uh, talks a little bit about uh, economics. And uh, here's the international legitimacy part. Um, Modi, uh, you know, uh, had criticized Congress for appeasing Pakistan, but he opts for cooperation. It's a hypothesis. I mean, it's hard to prove, but remember he was so active in the first few weeks of his first few months of going all over the world and all these uh, meetings that he had with leaders. And I would say that one of maybe deep down Modi wanted to again show a kind of good, uh, international good citizenship. Uh, that I'm not, you know, remember, the Western countries, when he was chief minister, didn't want him uh, to give him a visa, didn't want him to come and visit. Now, of course, he was prime minister. They couldn't say no, but he was reaching out to them also, I think, to sort of say, look, you thought I was a hardliner and so on. I can make an outreach to Pakistan. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not quite that. 
Uh, okay, uh, uh, what made it collapse? Again, the issue of, as you've seen, defection over, does Kashmir come first, a settlement, and that dries up terrorism? Or do we dry up terrorism and then you get a Kashmir settlement? Uh, and the two countries were not able to really uh, uh, deal with that. So let me stop there. I think uh, uh, systemic factors repeatedly of a certain kind have inclined them to, and I think still operate on them towards cooperation, even though right now the situation is not very good. Uh, some systemic factors somewhat play the other way. Domestic factors, particularly the economic ones, and the limits of violence in dealing with this specter of uh, terrorism seem to incline them again towards cooperation. But getting internal agreement on does Kashmir come first and a settlement of it, or does dealing with terrorism come first? The two sides not able to kind of sell that internally. They themselves don't know whether they can deliver on a commitment. Uh, I mean, to give the Pakistanis the benefit of doubt at this point, they probably, whatever they may say, they may not be in a position to dry up terrorism. And whatever we may say on our side, the climate may not be right for any Kashmir deal because a significant proportion of Indians may not buy any kind of change uh, on Kashmir, any kind of settlement on it uh, at this juncture either. So let me just stop there uh, with the thought that, you know, uh, we will probably see again more cycles of this attempted cooperation and then defection. Uh, hopefully someday there'll be a breakthrough, but uh, uh, you know, we could see more of this kind of diplomacy. Thanks a lot. I'm sorry for going over the time, but. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Professor Vajpayee, uh, for uh, an extremely exhaustive uh, narrative on both uh, what are these cycles, uh, how others have viewed the cycles and how you have viewed the cycles. Uh, primarily from uh, systemic uh, uh, drivers being your perspective here, uh, giving us in, indeed uh, a hopeful uh, uh, sort of projection that cycles would continue in coming times. And I think that's uh, that's a positive uh, way of looking forward in the way relationship will move. Uh, all participants have just heard Professor Bajpayee's uh, the way I was hearing, so I'm not saying anything in terms of briefing or concluding. We have a really large number of requests uh, for questions and to maximize. And now I can press on Professor Vatpe to stay with us uh, for a little longer than... Uh, than oh, yeah, yeah. No problem. I've, I've got lots of time. So, so uh, I'm going to request uh, uh, all participants to uh, you know, restrict yourself to just one minute uh, in terms of your intervention. Uh, you take first 10 seconds to introduce yourself and another... 45 seconds, uh, leaving the last five seconds uh, to make your intervention, either question or comment. Uh, and uh, uh, with my due respect, I'll request uh, Professor Bajpayee to take three to four minutes maximum in answering each question so that we can take uh, uh, we have a really long list right now. So uh, first, I request uh, uh, Priyanka Savant to unmute yourself. She's from Mumbai, one of your followers. And she sent me six questions for you, but I, I just her to brief maybe one or two uh, specific yeah. questions. So, Professor Bajpayee. Yes, Priyanka, please go ahead. Hello, sir. This is Priyanka. So, my first question to you is, do you think that reducing the strength of Pakistani diplomats from 110 to 55 is a step in the right direction? Because Pakistani embassy in New Delhi is uh, involved in a number of terrorist organizations. So my second question is, as you touched upon SARC in your opening remarks, Pakistan's non-cooperation has stalled many major initiatives under SARC. And if SARC becomes redundant, then there may be a possibility that the neighboring countries may join Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and it will be a critical setback for India. So what kind of reforms are needed to make SARC more effective? as Bimstick without Pakistan cannot be an alternative to SARC? Yeah, on the first one, I mean, I, I guess uh, being an ex-diplomat son, <laughs> um, I always think that, uh, you know, it's, it's good to have, uh, you know, stability in diplomatic relations. And um, um, now as to the precise number of people in the embassies and so on, uh, that's always uh, up for, for negotiation. I mean, and this is not unique to India and Pakistan. The United States and Soviet Union in the Cold War 
uh, would have discussions on this where they limited the numbers, uh, periodically threw people out. India and Pakistan have done it before. You're seeing what the Chinese and the Americans are doing today. I think, you know, it looks bad and uh, that there are uh, people in embassies doing these kinds of uh, activities. But the fact of the matter is that every embassy has uh, spooks in them for all countries. Uh, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, probably. Uh, and uh, the question really is, when does it get to, when do their activities get to the point that the host nation uh, simply can't tolerate it anymore? Usually, uh, the decision to get rid of people comes about when bigger issues have, have uh, caused trouble. And then the easiest thing you can do is kind of chuck out some of their diplomats and then they retaliate and it's a signal. Uh, it's not very effective uh, in, in achieving anything very much, uh, but uh, it's, it's a pretty standard procedure as well. So I would say that the real issue is uh, then is, uh, why does it get to the point where, you know, you want to take this, or do this kind of signaling? And uh, so there are all kinds of provocations at times when governments uh, want to do it. From the perspective of what I've been saying, I would say largely when you move against uh, diplomats in, in, a, in a high commission, this is signaling towards your own domestic audience that we're doing something, you know, and it's a very low level retaliation. Uh, getting in a very big embassy to get rid of some doesn't really make all that much difference. Uh, but it's a little kind of reminder and it speaks to your domestic audience. Um, so inevitably what happens is that after a while, uh, talking about cycles, uh, both sides will agree to probably bring the numbers back up uh, when they're more comfortable with each other. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a fact of diplomatic life everywhere in the world that there are a certain number of spies in these embassies and they're doing things that are, you know, are not considered proper. Uh, now, I don't know what exactly what the Pakistani diplomats in Delhi did. I'll take the Indian government's word for it. So they have to go. And then, uh, you know, the Pakistanis retaliate. On Sark, I think, I mean, we've arrived at a point where I would agree with what the Indian government has done, actually, which is, you know, because my thesis was on it. Uh, it's just stalled completely on the economic side. And Pakistan is largely the, uh, the problem. I wouldn't say it's the only problem. India also has had problems with uh, the free flow of goods and, and so on um, uh, from time to time with even smaller neighbors like Sri Lanka or Bangladesh. So, but all said and done, it's Pakistan and Sark that has really been the stall. And so uh, I think particularly under Mr. Modi and Jay Shankar, they've said, well, we will collaborate then with our smaller neighbors. So you get a kind of virtual Sark, uh, you know, without the Pakistanis in it and BIMSTEC and so on. I mean, take the story as far as you can go. Actually, the most important thing you can probably say there is that, you know, India has free trade agreements bilaterally with all its smaller neighbors anyway. It didn't really need SAFTA and SAFTA and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, it's an open border with Nepal pretty much. We had a free trade agreement of a certain kinds with, with the Sri Lankans and with the Bangladeshis later. There are concerns in Delhi about both, but all, all said and done, uh, Maldives don't matter very much. Uh, you know, three main countries that neighbor India, we have agreements with them anyway. Pakistan for a long time, uh, and probably even now, a lot of the trade is through the Gulf. So there's a certain amount of movement of goods that occurs regardless. So I think, you know, um, Sark, unfortunately, given that I invested two years of my life on it and was quite gung-ho on it, uh, has sort of, uh, sort of, uh, you know, gone into eclipse. Um, I don't have much thought. I don't think, uh, you know, India's SARC neighbors are going to join SCO. I think it's, I don't know quite where you have that sense of it from, but uh, uh, they're just too far away and probably uh, SCO doesn't want to expand that fast. So I don't see that as much of a problem. Yeah. We can go now to Dr. Naushin Basi. Please unmute yourself and make your introduction. Please. Thank you very much, Dr. Saran. It's a shared delight to listen to you, Professor Kanti. Uh, when Soren was uh, uh, mentioning how fond of his students uh, were in JNU, uh, let me also uh, confess here that we in Pakistan, I, I remember back in late 90s, we were a student and we all were really very fond of listening to Kanti Bajpai everywhere we go to. And when he used to 
perhaps two or three times he came to Pakistan as well. Uh, you made wonderful uh, uh, analysis about the cycle of conflict and cooperation between, between India and Pakistan. And I was noticing so many things, but you came up with the centrality of Kashmir issue from Pakistan's perspective and the issue of terrorism from Indian perspective. And I hope that you all will appreciate the fact that Pakistan went for this asymmetric warfare because of the undisputed, uh, uh, unsettled um, issue of Kashmir. So how do you see the way out of this situation? Because you see there is no uh, sign of change policies in either of the countries. And secondly, the last year, 5th August decision on Kashmir, how has it, uh, has it impacted on the cycle of cooperation and conflict between India and Pakistan? What's your take on this? Secondly, if I may allow to take more than one minute, uh, Dr. Soren talked about several uh, structural issues um, uh, in Pakistan's polity related to the idea and operationalization of Pakistan. You see, we have been encountering so many problems because of these issues. And um, people like me concluded uh, saying that we are living in two Pakistans. Uh, there is one Pakistan that is of the establishment Pakistan, and there is another Pakistan that is of people's Pakistan. And while establishment Pakistan sees the world and the relations with India in a different perspective, people's Pakistan see the perspective see the different perspective as far as Pakistan-India relations are, are concerned and, and uh, as far as our relations with the other countries are concerned. Uh, so you see, uh, you are to appreciate that fact as well. Thirdly, there is the hyphenated relationship over the period of time. You see, we hyphenate our relations with India at times with Pakistan. Now China is another important factor. Afghanistan has a very important role to play and the politics in that area. So how do they factor in India-Pakistan relations? What's your take on this? Thank you. Okay, well, that's uh, yes. quite all rather challenging. Um, I think uh, I, on the first issue of uh, what's the way out of the cycle of, you know, Pakistan's insistence on Kashmir and India's insistence on terrorism, I think both Vajpayee and Manmohan Singh on the Indian side and Nawaz Sharif and then Musharraf on the Pakistani side, I mean, did find their way almost to uh, squaring that circle, being able to reconcile those two positions. So, uh, and I think one sense I have is, I mean, I don't know what the answer is in the end. I mean, if I did, I would get a Nobel Prize, the Nobel Peace <laughs> Prize, but, um, but um, I mentioned the, the back channel and I am a supporter of the back channel, but up to a point. I think the back channel took uh, the two leaderships uh, to a point, but it also had the negative effect of keeping it so secretive and so ensconced that neither side had prepared public opinion on the other side, which kind of speaks to your last point, uh, Noshin, about uh, you know, there's the establishment in a country and then there's a larger society. In the end, you have to bring both on board if you're going to break through for a, a very big and dramatic deal. And the back channel, you know, it never got beyond, it didn't even get to the establishment. It was a very small coterie of people on both sides, deliberately kept that way. Uh, and when, say, for instance, Manmohan opened it up to uh, his senior cabinet members uh, that I mentioned, uh, they were pretty negative. Uh, I, I, partly because they hadn't been probably briefed all along. And they reacted very viscerally and said, basically said no. Um, and likewise, on the Pakistani side, there's some indication by Kasuri that, you know, uh, he, uh, Musharraf took all the core commanders along. There's no mystery about it. But, you know, if you look at how he dealt with uh, the FATA issue, where he did hide stuff, where he had, there were some core commanders he was closer to and some elements of the military and others were kept at some distance or kept in the fog. Suggests so that, you know, he hadn't even perhaps got his, his little coterie completely on board, just like Manmohan hadn't quite got his group on board. 
Likewise, Vajpayee, um, you know, uh, he and uh, 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 Jaswan seem to be more inclined to, you know, uh, go along with some kind of a deal, but Advani and other members of the cabinet uh, were not uh, quite there, uh, you know, uh, as well. So I think the, the, the issue for the future is that, I mean, even now the NSAs are talking to each other. We know that under Modi and uh, uh, under uh, Imran Khan. What they're talking, we don't know exactly, but it's a kind of a back channel, uh, not the old back channel, because these are two official uh, 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 people. But it'll have to, I think, uh, it depends on leaders being able to, at some point, at a crucial moment, take the, take, take the and, and begin to, you know, so I'm not sure where you lost me, but basically I was saying the back channel was both an opportunity and a constraint. Uh, it's a, a, a excessive focus on secrecy and keeping it very tight meant that um, uh, it didn't get a more a broader support in either place. And I think for the future, some leaderships, both on both sides, have to have the courage and the political support to be able to broaden uh, support for it and take it to the people eventually. Otherwise, we'll be in these cycles forever. Uh, okay, on the August 5th decision, I mean, obviously uh, it's had a, quite a mixed impact. I mean, I think it's fair to say whether you in India support uh, the scrapping of 370 or not, and I think most of the political parties have supported it now, most of the media and so on, uh, it's brought a certain kind of uh, clarity. Uh, this is, I don't think there's anyone who seriously thinks it can, it can be undone or it should be undone. Uh, the only question is whether Jammu and Kashmir will finally be declared a full state again. And uh, so I think that's probably pretty much a given on the Indian side. On the Pakistani side, I mean, you'll know better, but obviously uh, it, there's been a bad reaction to it. Um, but it's not the, the only time that there have been decisions on either side that have impacted very badly on the other. Uh, they found a way to come back to discussions. And the fact that the NSAs are talking despite August 5th, again, indicates that the two, the systemic forces, some of the domestic forces will again push them towards getting past the August 5th decision. Um, so I think that, you know, uh, I would look to a resumption of, of, uh, of engagement despite August the 5th, whatever one might think of it on, on both sides. And I mean, the larger issue of these uh, other countries, China, Afghanistan, and so on, uh, sh there is a view that, uh, you know, the August 5th decision has had an impact on how the Chinese think about Ladakh and, and its status and their, their kind of concerns there. But uh, really that, is, that whole Chinese calculation about uh, their ingress in Galwan and, and Depsang and, and so on is, is still very mysterious, I think. So it'd be a bit premature to to see whether you know it was really um, the August 5th decision or not that, that caused that. But what one probably can say is that uh, there are signs that China and Pakistan have had even closer discussions on strategic issues, perhaps uh, in the wake of August the 5th. Uh, they may have happened anyway. There's the CPEC, there are other developments, including uh, the American troops leaving Afghanistan. So that's not really related to India directly, necessarily. But uh, I think the China-Pakistan kind of strategic dialogue has probably deepened. Um, again, wh what would be the long-term effect on that with India is unclear. But I wouldn't necessarily say it, it, it's negative. Uh, after all, a part of Kashmir you know, uh, according to the 1963 agreement in Shak's Gam, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is part of the Kashmir problem. So um, I'll stop there. But I, I would say despite all these issues, uh, the, I would look to a cycle to resume without an enormous hope that uh, the cycle will be broken out of. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's, uh, let's now hear a voice from Myanmar. Now, I'll request uh, Dr. Hin Mang So, uh, please unmute yourself and make your intervention. One minute, I'm sorry. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. 
uh, recently, uh, China and Pakistan signed to start implementing a major hydro project dam in the disputed Jig Baltistan region on the Indu River. Indian government uh, Ministry of External Affairs expressed its concern on the project with strong term. We have cons consistently made our protests and share concern with both Pakistan and China on all such projects in the Indian territory and the Pakistan illegal occupation. Uh, my question to the professor, it will be future scenario of Indu River in India. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the great success stories in a way. Uh, in 1960, the Indus River uh, Treaty was signed uh, with the help of uh, uh, the World Bank and behind that were the Anglo-American powers. The Americans paid, you know, a half the amount for the development of the projects and the separation of the, of the rivers. Uh, I think they paid up to about $250 million or, or so. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, it was, it's, uh, it stood the test of time in the sense that uh, uh, despite war, uh, people have uh, stuck with it. Uh, both sides have stuck with it. Uh, nonetheless, of course, there are disagreements. Uh, interestingly, even on the disagreements, uh, while we in India particularly have been allergic to uh, outsiders, I mean, first of all, the treaty happened because of outside intervention as well. But uh, from time to time, the uh, international uh, mediation and adjudication on it, when it's been taken to third party adjudication, uh, which is uh, you know, within the treaty, the possibility of that is within the treaty, India has not done badly, actually. Uh, it's generally all its projects, even when the Pakistanis have objected, India has managed to go ahead with most of those projects because the decisions have favored India. I mean, we've had to, on the Indian side, lower the height of uh, a dam here or a project there. But on the whole, uh, India has done well out of those. So uh, there continue to be concerns in Pakistan about how much water comes in and so on and so forth. But, um, um, you know, the, the treaty has broadly stood the test of time. So I think, uh, obviously, as in the past, uh, I don't know enough about this particular project, excuse me, but um, uh, clearly, I mean, uh, there will be disagreements over projects. Uh, there continue to be Pakistani objections to Indian projects, and then, of course, uh, Indian objections to Pakistani projects. I mean, to the extent that there's Chinese collaboration in them, of course, that will heighten the, the difficulty diplomatically. Um, and my worry here is whether, unlike in the past, when there were disputes over projects, uh, there was agreement eventually to take them to an international you know, adjudicator. Um, whether with uh, too much of a Chinese presence or involvement, whether Delhi will now balk at that and step back from that. It has served India's interest pretty well, uh, you know, uh, the, pr the adjudication procedure. But if there's too ostensive a Chinese involvement in some of these projects, then I think I could, uh, it's fairly safe to predict that India might begin to uh, balk at the involvement of adjudicators. So I see a danger there, frankly. Um, and after a period of five or six or 10 years where, you know, Pakistan was quite activist on the Indus River's waters issue, it had started to somewhat pull back in, I think particularly as a result of these uh, decisions by the uh, international adjudicators. But uh, if China is involved, uh, one might uh, expect that, you know, the issue would start to bubble again. So I, I have a, it's not quite a prediction, but I have a fear that the Indus River's water issue might uh, suddenly come back uh, into focus after it had kind of edged away for the last four or five years or six years. Thank you, uh, Vaibhav Khandu. Uh, please unmute yourself, introduce yourself in 10 seconds, and then 40 seconds for your question. Uh, sir, my question uh, was pertaining to Indus Water Treaty. Uh, right. What is the foreseeable uh, future for this treaty, uh, considering? So he's looking at this as uh, CVMs between two. You just answered right. partly that question, and you can quickly answer this one. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, again, as I said, it's been a pretty good treaty. Uh, it could have been much more ambitious. So river water experts have said that uh, both countries took the easy way out, which is just uh, do a division of three rivers and three rivers on, on the two sides. Uh, it hasn't looked at the full potential of joint development of these rivers, hydroelectricity, uh, environmentally, and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> but um, given uh, the times, it was probably the best we could achieve at, uh, at that juncture. Um, I don't see any great option. I mean, periodically when uh, India becomes upset over some actions of Pakistan, it threatens to revise the treaty or scrap the treaty. But, you know, that's a very, very difficult business. And one reason for that, of course, is that it's not that easy to stop the flow of water. Uh, these are massive waters flowing uh, and stopping them uh, is just a very difficult geological engineering issue. Uh, you stop them, the water has to go somewhere. Uh, you might risk flooding in your own uh, territories uh, or other difficulties with the ecology of the river. So I must say that those who periodically, when, on the Indian side, when we get up impatient with Pakistan and threaten to, to scrap the treaty and so on, it's really not very credible. Uh, it's okay to lash out, but uh, technically, engineering-wise, uh, it just does not seem environmentally, it just does not seem to me uh, very, very feasible. There's the, the larger international politics of it, which is surely, uh, you know, there would be quite an outcry internationally. And lastly, I suppose there's some legal, uh, there'd be an international legal problem because it is a, a treaty. Uh, signed, sealed, and delivered. Uh, India has received money. Pakistan has received money for it. Uh, there are certain obligations. Uh, you scrap it. Uh, there would be uh, concerns about that internationally. So I think it's, it's easy to lash out at the treaty. It's probably safe to say that, you know, if you open it up to revision like Pakistan wants, on the other hand, uh, that won't work either. Uh, given where we are today, uh, a, a real attempt to open it up and renegotiate the whole thing, uh, we probably never get an agreement, even as good as the one we have for both sides. Uh, so it's one of those Pandora's boxes. You don't want to really open it up. Uh, probably have to live with with uh, uh, it, warts and all, uh, both sides. Let me call Manav Lal now. Please unmute yourself, Manav Lal. Thank you, sir. Uh, so my question to you, there is a very general perception of how uh, there needs to be international mediation between India and China to strengthen their bilateral relations. Now, while that is um, there, sir, do you think going forward, India and uh, Pakistan can specifically strengthen their bilateral relations without any international mediation? And how well will this be taken by the international coalition led by the United States of America and China? Okay, so uh, you began by talking about mediation between India and China, which I, I think you meant India and Pakistan, probably. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, again, I, in another piece I've written, I've shown that, uh, I mean, just very dispassionately, uh, that empirically, historically, the evidence shows that outside powers uh, have mediated informally, formally. And it's not clear that we've always in India done badly out of mediation. Uh, you know, uh, in fact, if you go back to even to Kashmir, uh, it's a hard truth, but we nearly got a UN mediated agreement back in the 50s, almost. Uh, so um, mediation can work, not always. It may make things more complicated. I understand that, uh, of course, but uh, but what is true is that where we are placed historically today, uh, really formal mediation doesn't seem to be on the cards for Delhi and for Indians. Um, I think there's so much kind of, quite a lot of misrepresentation, but also some genuine concerns about mediation. And so there just isn't that kind of political climate in India to really accept formal, very obvious public mediation. On the other hand, there's constant mediatory kinds of interventions going on quietly, um, which both sides are aware of, both sides accept up to a point. Pakistan always has 
preferred more mediation as the, the weaker part. Uh, but India, I think since nuclearization, and I tried to show a little bit in the paper, India has certainly been aware of and accepted uh, particularly the American role in trying to help stabilize you know, the relationship with Pakistan at crucial junctures. And the Americans under Clinton intervened in Cargill uh, and perhaps at least speeded up resolution of, of that episode. Uh, after that, the Americans were constantly trying to engage both sides uh, through the Operation Parakram of 0102 and counseling, you know, please try to be careful, uh, we don't want this blowing up. And um, Indian diplomats were very much in touch with and, and used, uh, I think it's on record, used uh, American pressures again on Pakistan uh, to, um, to get Musharraf to come on television and promise that uh, you know, he would control terrorism. Um, so I think India has shifted. Uh, if there has been a shift, it is that India has shifted towards acceptance of some international below the radar screen mediation uh, in ways and at times when we're comfortable. And this really is a code word for American, the American role, because there's no other power that is really very tellingly able to uh, you know, uh, mediate. Um, and uh, uh, certainly not uh, China. Although I think, and again, I think in Delhi, we won't uh, publicly say it. There was a time when India uh, was moving quite nicely along with China on various issues. And part of that effort was to try and pull the Chinese away from Pakistan and get Beijing to use its influence on Islamabad to be more businesslike and uh, deal with India uh, in a better way, help up terrorism and so on. I mean, I recall that uh, one of the summits that Manmohan Singh, uh, if I recall correctly, had with his Chinese counterpart, I think it was before Xi Jinping, um, uh, it was explicitly said in that in that dialogue, uh, China and India discussed the problem of Pakistan. Well, not the problem of Pakistan, but discussed Pakistan. Um, and uh, we at the LKY school, we've had a China-India track to dialogue uh, with Indian and Chinese participants. And in that, it's been also very clear that uh, the, Pakistan, the Chinese have their own worries about Pakistan. And uh, there were discussions there on the future of, of uh, Pakistan. Um, so I think informally, uh, even the Chinese to some extent have been used by India at particular junctures, not today but maybe a decade ago to try and get some leverage over Pakistan. I'd say that's where it stands. I mean, I don't think the Indian public will accept a reaching out to uh, formal mediation, particularly, you know, uh, given India's growing power and so on. Uh, Mr. Modi and Jay Shankar have been talking about India as a leading power, a power that shapes the international environment to suit India, uh, to uh, push its goals. Uh, so if you see yourself as a leading power, a shaping power, uh, then you're not that prone to look at others shaping your environment, uh, even if in a mediatory way. So I think it's a fact of life that big powers, whether we like it or not, will tend to poke their noses into your business. The question is how much you're willing to accept of that and how you turn and use that for your advantage. The Pakistanis try that, the Indians try it. So uh, I think it's going to continue informally for sure. Um, today, I mean, uh, how well uh, you saw various statements from uh, Clinton, uh, not Clinton, uh, Trump, you know, uh, at various points, which have made India somewhat uncomfortable, uh, reaching out to the Pakistanis and saying, oh, well, I'll, I'll be a mediator on Kashmir and so on. And then uh, on, with China as well, you know, I, I'll be a, a, a good citizen between India and China. Uh, but, you know, those are not very, very serious uh, kinds of uh, statements, I think. And uh, uh, Delhi would not uh, take them very far. Thank you. Uh, Dhritiman Mukherjee, please unmute yourself, introduce yourself and ask your question, please. Thank you, sir. My name is uh, Dhritiman Mukherjee. I am doing my PhD in Presidency uh, University, Kolkata. Sir, uh, my question is a very short one. Uh, Sir, how far do you think that the presence of nuclear weapons has actually created a space for limited conflict between India and Pakistan? Yeah. 
Well, I mean, I think uh, the answer has been known for quite some time and uh, uh, that it has created a space. Um, and uh, on the Pakistani side, uh, uh, extremists have taken advantage of that, sometimes with the, the elements of the Pakistani government behind them, sometimes operating on their own to, to uh, you know, to inflict cross-border terrorism. Uh, on the Indian side, uh, a space has opened up for forms of retaliation. On the Pakistani side, apart from cross-border cross terrorism, uh, uh, there, there was a feeling at Kargil that uh, with the nuclear shield behind them, they could push into, uh, you know, uh, several kilometers into India uh, and uh, with regular forces. Uh, so, you know, that's more than cross-border terrorism. That's, uh, that's a kind of salami slicing away at uh, by regular forces. And India was able to respond to that full-blown war, pretty much. A small war by you know, international standards. But, I mean, these were two... This is the f first war... Uh, in 1999, between two nuclear armed powers, except for the Chinese and the, the Soviets back in 1969. Uh, that was probably the first instance of two nuclear armed powers fighting, you know, full on battles or at the Asuri River. Uh, and then after that, you get 30 years of a wait before, you know, uh, two nuclear armed powers fight each other. So in the literature, as you know, on uh, nuclear weapons. It's been known for a long time that that was a possibility. Going back to Glenn Snyder's work and the whole idea of the stability and stability paradox and so on. And I remember, I mean, just on a personal note, the day India tested, I think I was on television on one of the channels, maybe NDTV or one of the others, uh, saying that exactly that, that, you know, we'll have to be very careful. We've done the tests, the Pakistanis are likely to follow. In any case, everyone knew the Pakistanis had nuclear weapons. But a space has been created now, I said, where uh, the Pakistanis will be able to use uh, that shield to push people across the border and, and, and so on if they want to. And uh, so, yeah, that idea has been around and it, it's, uh, it's likely to remain. But what is true is that after the initial kind of decade or so of, of that possibility, I think a realization has grown on both sides that uh, there is a problem. You know, um, you can only go so far. Uh, take, for example, I mean, India articulated uh, in the military the idea of the cold star. But no Indian government has actually formally approved cold star. That tells you something. Uh, it tells you at least that there's some concern about how credible that is in terms of, you know, not just achieving military objectives and political objectives, but whether it can be controlled in escalatory terms. Likewise, the Pakistanis, I think, I tried to show the paper also, have you know, uh, realized that um, beyond the point, they can't be provocative also. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, there's been some learning, I think, uh, as a result, which doesn't mean that it, it couldn't get out of hand, uh, but it does mean that, yeah, there's been some rethinking on both sides of how much force one can use uh, in this uh, uh, space, in this treated space. Uh, hopefully it'll persist, but... Um, uh. Yes, uh, Silky Kaur, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, Professor Bajpai, she is the latest PhD from Seaport. She had her viva yesterday. Okay. Thank yes, you, Silky sir. Yes, Kaur, please go ahead. Thank you, sir, for your talk. My uh, question to you is that Pakistan has used subconventional warfare against India till now, but after the, and India was not able to retaliate uh, for the fear of nuclear escalation. But as uh, uh, after the PM Modi regime, India has uh, re uh, responded by Balakot strikes and surgical strikes. So India has changed its strategy. So I would like to have your views that how you see this change the strategy of India against Pakistan and is it and also your views on nuclear deterrence uh, conversion into nuclear coercion dynamic between India and Pakistan yeah well I mean again uh, it seems to me that um, uh, there is that space for those strikes I mean it's just empirically true they've occurred um, 
uh, or how effective they've been in terms of coercing the Pakistanis to adopt a different kind of policy. That's, I think, still a very open question. And there are different views on that. Uh, some people think that the strikes have been a complete failure. Um, and some think that it's had some effect, perhaps, um, and that it could be refined and, and maybe deployed again. Um, so yeah, there is that space. I mean, I, I think there's no doubt about it. And it's a, a space that was understood almost from the dawn of the nuclear era. Uh, so um, there's nothing you know, uh, that speaks to the genius of Indians and Pakistanis in this. Uh, uh, asymmetric warfare, uh, limited war, uh, these were always thought to be uh, plausible under nuclear, uh, you know, when both sides have nuclear weapons, and um, that's uh, that's that exists. Um, so, I, I mean, the short answer is that it could happen again. Uh, what's interesting is that I said earlier that the Indian government had not authorized coal start formally, but India seems to have hit on something much short of that. Uh, which are these uh, surgical strikes or however you want to uh, characterize them. Um, and um, so, you know, I, there will be lots of uh, thinking on the Indian side of how it can be used and equally on the Pakistani side of uh, how it can be responded to in, in turn with both sides not wanting to escalate too far. Um, I mean, I would just note that to the extent that the argument rests on uh, the view that uh, the bigger country has escalation dominance. Escalation dominance is that you can up the ante, you can up the amount of violence or threaten to because you've got more weapons, basically, and more effective weapons. And so that will, in the end, cause the other to stand down. I mean, the one difficulty here is, and it relates a bit to China, is that potentially we've got the same problem in reverse with the Chinese which is to say that India is the relatively weak power, uh, although it's, it's complicated on the, along the border and so on and so forth, but India is in a relatively weak position and would face the same argument from the other side, which is that we will have the problem in terms of escalation dominance, um, should it ever come to that. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, this is why probably deep down the Indian government is rather careful about uh, using this strategic space and a cold start-like response. Remember, cold start was a massive shallow push into Pakistani territory and a holding operation then by different battle groups uh, with uh, a view to some extent at uh, attrition warfare, chewing up a lot of Pakistani equipment. Um, and then using that presence and that attrition to not to threaten outright conquest, because then you're, you're gonna uh, trigger the tripwire of perhaps a full-blown nuclear uh, retaliation, but as a bargaining chip, we're in, in control of so much territory and we're uh, destroying your equipment, now come to terms. But, you know, I think um, that going that far has, has, has uh, seemingly has not played with, uh, not convinced the Indian government. Uh, so we're at a much lower level of retaliation than that. The problem is, does that, do those surgical strikes extract enough of a cost to persuade your antagonist, your adversary, uh, to stop what they're doing? I think that's a very open debate at this point. Um, you know, and um, yeah, I mean, deterrence and lapsing into coercive diplomacy. I mean, I think, again, it was always conceptually, theoretically understood that while deterrence theory looks very neat and tidy, you know, it's a threat of punishment uh, through possible retaliation against an adversary who might want to strike you first. Um, uh, the point is that asymptotically, if you just push that out, uh, you sort of say, well, that almost becomes then, you know, uh, you lapse into almost preemption. I mean, if you know that the other side is preparing to attack you, and you got deterrence in place, which is the threat of punishment if they threaten to attack you and, and so on. But your thinking then might be eventually, well, I've got enough military power. I mean, at what point do I just simply deter 
especially when there's this strategic space where they can use asymmetric uh, tactics against you. And at what point do we use, go from deterrence into coercive diplomacy then and use our military strength? When does it go from being retaliatory capacity to preemptive capacity? And so there was always in deterrence the, the worry about would the other side see your development of weaponry and military capacity as simply defensive, that is deterrent, or would it begin to fear that under the guise of deterrence, you were actually building up enough power to be preemptive, you see? So I think that, again, military planners are very much aware of this and they have to very carefully proceed. How much, you know, there's a famous book in the Cold War by Alan Eindhoven, a uh, military strategic planner, who wrote a book called How Much is Enough? So you've got to think as how much is enough with nuclear weapons and conventional weapons when do you slip from signaling deterrence to coercive diplomacy to preemption? There's a more of a continuum there than we think. Conceptually, deterrence seems to be this, but as you refine your deterrent force more and more and more to make sure you've got a stable retaliatory capacity, your opponent might begin to not see that and, and see something else, something more aggressive. Now that's true for Pakistan too. They're building a deterrent. We may think that they're going too far. That might be true of China. That might be true of us. That's true for all nuclear powers, that there's a kind of a slippery slope or a thin line or a shading off between deterrence, coercive diplomacy, and then preemption, outright preemption. So that, those are you know elements of strategy that one really has to think about very carefully and can be worrisome. Thank you. I see uh, Dr. Balvinder Kumar with me. I see Dr. Chandra Bhushan Nagar with me. I saw some other people on screen, but they are no longer with us. Uh, yeah. So maybe because this session was from 11.30 to 1 p.m. India time, we have crossed 150 almost now. So if yeah. you have left, uh, I apologize, but then I can't help. But if you're still with us and you are requested, please switch on your video. I'll keep coming to all of you. I'm uh, able to indulge, uh, you know, uh, Professor yeah. Kanti is able to indulge us with more time. I'm, 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 since Balakot and nuclear escalation, since Balakot and nuclear escalation has come in, I would now request uh, Professor Farooq uh, Khan to come in. He's from Lahore, so maybe we want to have uh, one more view from Pakistan uh, yeah. coming in at this stage. Uh, uh, th thank you, uh, Professor uh, Vajpai. I joined in a little bit late, but I really enjoyed uh, uh, the kind of detailed, uh, I think, historical perspective that you were uh, able to provide. My uh, question uh, and a comment is, uh, maybe comment first, which is uh, that you mentioned on a number of occasions things which are uh, kind of maybe divisions within the Pakistani uh, response, maybe like you know, some elements within Pakistan and stuff. So I was wondering if you would use the same perspective for the Indian response vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. I mean, and again, the case in point comes uh, this arrest of, uh, you know, uh, the Vinder Singh from Kashmir and the connection that there was. There was some thing in the news about Colonel Prohit, about some Jota Express. So num number of things that I think it enhances the perspective that one is trying to, especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, the students. The second is, I think, the surgical strike uh, it continues to be viewed very differently, I think, in India uh, as it is in Pakistan. Uh, for us, uh, again, depending on how one is looking at it, uh, for the Indians, it might be something that they would want to do uh, uh, maybe more. But for Pakistan, it was a huge success um, because they were able to capture Abhinandan. It caused international embarrassment and stuff, all, 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 all that. So my issue is, I think, like when one is discussing this with students, it might not be a very comfortable thing, but the thing is, I think like for the students, one needs to say that these are things that one needs to question one's own state as well, that it can't be the us and them. I think so that's, that's my uh, first, that was my comment. Second, my question is that, uh, that earlier on you mentioned the back channels. With Zoom, there are new opportunities 
of having contact and again as people who are involved in the academia i've been doing it for the last 10 years because i've been teaching a course on partition for the last 20 years so i've taken my students um, to jnu to you know lady shri ram college ram just college number of times so what is it that again a forums uh, uh, such as these that do you think that it is worth one's while to encourage people who it's, it's not that they're going to become good friends but the thing is i think that whole demonization of the other uh, which is again this arnab goswami and sudhir choudhary and these and that uh, kind of people that one is able to see beyond that so i, I just wanted thank you to you we got to a question now yeah. yes please. thank you thank you sorry it was a bit long yeah no thanks a lot thanks for your uh, very nice uh, comments and question um i think uh, i mean I, i do try and point out in the paper that uh there are internal differences in india also i mean uh in the case of uh, the musharraf manmohan uh perhaps you missed it but i did show that try to show that uh, you know there was differences even in the congress party over it clearly and uh, i spoke earlier in the the uh, talk about uh you know the the kind of outbidding uh temptation uh, each party or group or faction or uh, tries to be more nationalist than the other and Uh, so you see that and sometimes it's more the expectation that they will be outbidding uh, that causes governments to pull back even before the outbidding has occurred it's the worry that your opponent will do it regardless of whether they've done it or not um that that plays a role and that's it's there very much in india uh, we can see that on domestic issues on uh, such as kashmir but also on relations with pakistan and, and china so i mean uh, there's no doubt that uh, uh, you know there there have been differences amongst high level decision makers on both sides there are bigger polarizations also i mean uh, within uh, between kind of a more left center and and right in india and in pakistan there are constituencies there that in both countries that have differences so it's not just that you know core commanders in musharraf disagreed on nawaz sharif and musharraf disagreed on imran and and uh, nawaz disagreed but there are larger kind of narratives that are in contention in both these countries uh which involve you know potentially millions of people who would come down on this side or the other uh, which is why i was making the point that it, it i think at a point the back channel is useful but the back channel encapsulates and traps also and uh, it, it, if it's not kind of if it's taken too far it doesn't allow for an issue and an historical possibilities to be vented and discussed more freely and then a certain kind of you know a certain kind of uh, consensus to to emerge uh, which are important if you really want to if two countries want to become two societies want to become friends um so uh i think yeah i mean i i certainly wouldn't say that the issue of divisions and differences is uh, purely in the pakistani side by no means uh that that would not be the case yeah i mean again on the surgical strikes um uh you know it, it, i agree that it would be seen differently on both sides um and uh it's not clear even in in uh, in india uh that uh, you know the strikes have been a great success and there is commentary that has questioned uh the the uh efficacy of the strikes uh so uh i mean there's there are students here but i think they're probably quite aware that there are different views in india on how 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 uh, was the bala code actually did they hit the terrorist target uh you know what were the uh, competencies or incompetencies of uh, dealing with then the the pakistani air force uh, retaliation uh, knocking down one of your own helicopters on and uh, then losing an aircraft and so on and so forth so you know these issues have been vented and um, part of the reason for that is that there's also now you know satellite imagery and so on that uh, people can access to see uh, to bolster their points of view um but yeah i mean i would certainly go along with the view that uh, which i i i mentioned uh, which is that i mean you can do these strikes uh, because there's a strategic logic and space for it to be done but uh, as i said i mean what kinds of costs uh, attached to that view is that you know you're inflicting some costs on the other side they may be symbolic costs they may be real material costs uh, they may be extra regional costs uh, so pakistan 
uh, is you know belittled or humiliated by the the strike against them, or India is humiliated by the counter strike. Um, it, uh, my own instinct is that the strikes really have not been very effective on either side. I mean, they haven't. Uh, you say Pakistan has managed to you know uh, cast doubt on perhaps India's military efficacy, uh, its competence, and and um, uh, you know and so forth, and its claims have been called into doubt internationally. I think that's true, but how much of a conflict, uh, how much of a cost has it inflicted on in India? Would it stop India doing it in the future? Would it bring India to the negotiating table on Kashmir? Likewise, have the Indian strikes really uh, caused Pakistan to rethink certain postures and statements and, and proclivities? No. And um, uh, so probably these strikes and retaliation speak far more to domestic audiences. Uh, I think, having said that, I mean, of course, we can be very cynical about them uh, and say, oh, yeah, it's all just about manipulating domestic opinion. But I think to be fair to politicians also, you know, they are under pressure. Uh, they do feel the need. I mean, there's just a kind of, again, I, I, I use the word, there's a practice, there's a kind of political routine or uh, expectation that uh, that's so ingrained in all of us, including the political leadership, that when you're challenged in these ways, I mean, you have to give, you may not change the behavior of opponent, but you have to give something to your own tribe. Uh, you have to give them a certain amount of blood. You have to give them a severed head. I mean, I'm just speaking metaphorically there, but, you know, uh, but we know that there have been severed heads, in fact, on the line of control. Uh, just look at the book by... Uh, our colleague at Seaford, uh, 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 Happy Mon Jacob, who documents the case. So, you know, it, as an sociologist, anthropologist, historian, political scientist, we know, regrettable as it may be, that there has to be a, a kind of, you know, uh, there's a bloodlust that populations have. And, uh, you know, there's a deep kind of in human uh, groupings. Uh, giving the group uh, uh, the severed head um, at times, uh, regrettable and awful as it may be at, at, at moments. But, you know, it's not that easy for anyone to resist it. So I think, you know, anthropologists would really testify to that kind of very deep social practice that exists in groupings. And I mean, to flip it, I would say that, as I was trying to say earlier, which is, at least we don't have cold stuff. We don't have full-on missile or preemptive strikes or full-on retaliation by Pakistan or whatever it is. So, you know, uh, Shamit Ganguly in that piece that I, ad I adverted to at the beginning, uh, where he talked in 1991, 92 about the various cooperative acts, one of the points he made was that, yeah, there's bloodletting between the two sides, but seen in a global historical context, it's been relatively... Uh, low. And one of the things I'm fond of saying, and I say to students when I teach strategic studies and so on, is that fortunately, uh, the only place in Asia that has never had total warfare is South Asia. Uh, China had it through the Civil War and the, the, the warfare with the Japanese in, from 1937 to 45. Japan had it. Uh, you know, Southeast Asia had it, whether they liked it or not, because the Japanese invaded and then the Allies had to fight back. I mean, entire populations were potentially at, put at risk, were targeted, uh, had to be mobilized to fight and to win. But that's never happened in South Asia, fortunately. Uh, you know, uh, and I think, I mean, on the other side, I've said that that has meant that Indians and Pakistanis and South Asians maybe don't think strategically very clearly, because total warfare really makes you think strategically. I mean, we're talking big, big time losses and bloodlust then. So you're forced into thinking strategically. But I think fortunately, South Asia has not had total warfare. And that's something to build on. And I think these strikes and all of that, I mean, I'm not endorsing them necessarily, but I'm just saying that very analytically, uh, at least it's been kept there. And my instinct is that it'll still be kept there. And if you take someone like Bharat Karnad, the Indian strategist, uh, who's quite uh, you know, strong on military uh, responses and so on, 
he notices this with India, Pakistan. His concern is more China, but he notices this between India and Pakistan. And he, he argues for India. And he says there is a possibility of India-Pakistan reconciliation. And even between the militaries, because they came, there are social links and historical links between the militaries and these two societies. And therefore, they also are hesitant to wreck uh, terrible punishment on each other when they go to war. Um, casualties have been very low in the four wars. I mean, again, any death is sad, but uh, really, in, in a global scale, these wars are, I mean, they're nothing. They're tiny. So I, I just want to leave it there. Uh, you know. Thank you. We have oh, yeah, on the back channels and Zooms, I mean, I think, yeah, this is, I was saying before we began that one of the great uh, silver linings of COVID has been that these kinds of links are now plausible. I mean, uh, there may be someone from uh, intelligence bureaus listening in on this. I mean, I'm fine with it. Uh, but uh, at least we're being able to connect to people across borders and have conversations that otherwise would be difficult because you wouldn't get the visa. And I wouldn't get the visa. No. Luckily, uh, we may not necessarily need the visas to talk to each other. And I think yeah. our participants from exactly. Pakistan are most welcome to participate in the Zoom seminars. Yeah, uh, we have a research scholar from uh, from uh, Kashmir, from Sri Nagar, uh, Sajad Ahmed Dar. I will request you to unmute. Yes, and uh, ask your question. Yes, uh, uh, my, my question is, uh, Dr. Kanti Bajpayee, sir, is that uh, uh, terrorism and the Kashmir issue are among the contentious issues between India and Pakistan, and it has always uh, derailed uh, prosperous prospectus of uh, Sarak as an institution. Can it is possible between India and Pakistan that uh, let we uh, sideline it for some time, for 10 years, 20 years, so that we can uh, achieve the real objectives of SARC uh, that uh, were laid down in 1985 with its uh, formation? Can it possible as it has uh, somehow purely derailed the prospectus of institution of SARC? Well, I mean, again, going back to an earlier reply and discussion, um, I mean, clearly, you know, India-Pakistan tensions have damaged Sark. Um, the terrorism has, you know, uh, uh, meant that the region continues to be unstable. Sark has no position on, really, on terrorism. I mean, it has had discussions on it, uh, and uh, obviously it has sort of condemned it and so on. But, uh, you know, again, we're back to the familiar problem of, one man's terrorism and another man's, uh, you know, uh, freedom struggle and so on. So I think as a result of that, I mean, the discussions in SARC and so on, even the UN, India has pushed for years for a international accepted definition of terrorism and has never got one. Um, so SARC has, in that sense, can't really do much about it. Um, yeah, I mean, and as a result, I mean, SARC has not grown, uh, BIMSTEC and so on, I think, uh, hold out some promise, mostly because of the geo geography of South Asia. Cooperation is really between India and the small, the other neighbors. Uh, I mean, it's hard to imagine quite how Bangladesh and Nepal would cooperate, given the big chunk of territory between them, which is occupied by India. Likewise, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. I mean, again, I mean, most of the the kind of infrastructure co cooperation and so on that one might envisage. It's all between India and its smaller neighbors, not, not Bangladesh to Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka to Nepal. So in a way, I mean, Sark or no Sark, uh, India can move forward with all its neighbors uh, bilaterally um, to uh, put together, um, you know, uh, collaborative projects. Nepal and Bangladesh and India as a trilateral is somewhat plausible because one uh, possibility that the Nepalese wanted for a long time was their uh, transit through India to Chittagong uh, port, rather than let's say Calcutta or wherever. Uh, so, you know, th there's that possibility. The Nepalese at one point in the 80s had raised the issue of uh, trilateral river water cooperation. When India and Bangladesh were talking about uh, river waters, the sharing of the Ganga and all that, uh, Nepal wanted to also get in on the discussion. Um, but eventually, you know, that didn't go uh, very far. And even the Bangladeshis were somewhat reluctant uh, to deal with it trilaterally. So, um, yeah, not much scope for region-wide projects of that kind. I think standard setting, 
uh, you know, um, responses by uh, the region to kind of uh, uh, public goods issues. Uh, so if there's uh, climate change, uh, a famine that's widespread in the region, an epidemic or pandemic, um, you know, um, those kinds of issues uh, really, uh, uh, you know, cyclone, extreme weather events. And these are probably all going to grow in the years and decades ahead. Uh, they would be quite properly, probably region-wide um, uh, challenges. But again, I mean, if you think about it just very coolly, uh, what's, the, what's the likelihood that Sri Lanka can do much for Bangladesh in a situation like that? I mean, no offense to our smaller neighbors, but their capabilities are quite limited. Uh, and they're geogra geographically far away. Uh, and that holds for many of these uh, smaller neighbors. So it's really what they can do for India in the various regions and what India can do for them. I mean, I can imagine that uh, small states that border India in areas where India may not be able to be the first respondent on its own territory, because there are parts of India that might be closer to, let's say, Nepalese territory or Nepalese administrative capacity, likewise in Bangladesh's case, the first responders might be our neighbors. And then we, we get our, our, our responders up there. So it's not that it's all one way. It would all be India helping its neighbors, smaller neighbors. Uh, India's neighbors might also be able to be helpful. And on an issue like a pandemic, you want common standards because there's a movement of people. Uh, so if your neighbors are doing something else and say dealing with COVID or tuberculosis or whatever, and you're doing something else, that may not be a very happy situation for India because you want to be all operating with similar protocols. Uh, likewise, refugees, if climate change occurs, we may get hundreds of thousands or millions of refugees in the next 50 years from um, you know, uh, different countries. Right? I mean, India will have to deal with its neighbors to handle that. Um, and have agreements on what are they going to do? Uh, there's refugee law, uh, you know, and uh, we're bound by it as well. Uh, so uh, we have to work with our neighbors on, on that. Uh, are we uh, allowing people to come in as climate refugees, uh, when, which in a sense you're bound to do if they seek refuge in your country? And you're also not supposed to do what is called refoulement, which is send them on to a third country. Uh, so, you know, but um, will you observe all those protocols? You need to work with your neighbors on that. So, I mean, I think the, the broad point I'm developing is that while it's sad that SARC has not really flowered, uh, effectively, India working with its smaller neighbors uh, to develop uh, cooperative protocols and capabilities is really the, is really the way to go. Uh, and uh, that, that, that includes with Pakistan. I mean, there have been earthquakes where we've helped each other out, as I pointed out in the paper. Um, you know, uh, flooding might be another area. The environmental uh, problems of the Indus rivers would be another area potentially. Uh, Siachen uh, is, uh, you know, is an area of conflict, but it's, a, it's called the third pole. If it begins to melt or if it's otherwise environmentally damaged, both countries are going to pay a price. Uh, so we may have to get together on the it has been a proposal by Indians and Pakistanis and others to declare Siachen a peace park. Now, that may never quite happen, but uh, to withdraw forces, but at least one might imagine that uh, there would be exchange of data on how to maintain the, the sanctity uh, of the, the glacier and not allow it to, to melt and to uh, pollute. So I think even with India, between India and Pakistan, there are many things that may need to be done and climate change may force the issue in all of us. Uh, refugees, disease vectors, uh, all kinds of things, uh, all kinds of disruptions, which will make COVID look like, you know, a walk in the park, as the Americans say. You know, they, yeah. So I think, you know, potentially ahead, SARC or no SARC, there's a huge cooperative uh, venture uh, and po possibility. And India ha uh, does show some leadership there, but it could probably do more and our neighbors can, uh, can uh, do more as well. Thank you. Uh, we had this one and a half hour session and we have gone one hour, 15 minutes beyond our scheduled time. So thank you for your indulgence, uh, Professor Vajpayee. But let me now close it.
and I will call three last names which I yeah. still see on my screen and apologies if I don't see people on my screen. The last names I'm requesting are uh, Pramod and that Dr. Chandra Bhushan Nagar and finally uh, Dr. Bindar Kumar. So please, uh, if you can hear me, and I think I'm disconnected now, perhaps. Uh, we can hear you. Uh, okay. So uh, can I request uh, uh, Pramod Mahajan, uh, Pr Pramod, <laughs> Pramod Raman to please unmute yourself yeah. and uh, make your intervention, please. Maybe what I'll do, what I'll do is uh, now that there are just three and then we have to end it, I'll take all three and then yes. I'll reply to them all in one go. Yeah. So maybe yes. all three can go one after the other and then I'll just uh, come back on, on, on it. That's right. So let's have a, a Pramod Raman first, please. Hello, uh, I'm, I'm Pramod. I'm from University of Calicut. Yes. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, my question is related to uh, the uh, two recent developments. One is related to the uh, status of Kashmir, special status of Kashmir, which has been uh, turned over by the Indian government, and the response on the Pakistani uh, side in terms of hosting Kashmiri flag on the POK. Uh, my question is, uh, can LOC, line of control, which uh, uh, never been taken seriously by the two countries on the part of uh, historical reasons, ideology, all these things, uh, hindrances for resolving that uh, happening all these three, all these years, whether these uh, steps, one, the special status of Kashmir being removed on one side by Indian government, on the other side, whether this could be understood in the uh, political leadership as a win-win situation for their own domestic audience, that we have done something on Kashmir, and Pakistan side also doing that, whether that could be a, 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 a starting point of uh, separating the larger rhetoric on the one side and making a realistic approach towards resolving the uh, border dispute between India and Pakistan. Thank you, Dr. Chandrabhushan yeah. Nagar. Please tell yourself and uh, yeah. make your interview. Yeah, myself, Dr. Chandrabhushan Nagar. I'm a colleague from National Defense Academy. I've uh, I've just tried to ask a question, and before that, just one minute, I will take. Uh, Professor Vajpayee, thank you so much. Uh, I'm meeting you after say uh, 16 years because I met you when you were in Doon School, Dehradun. I oh, came yeah. to you for my PhD, but if you may remember, <laughs> thank you so yes, much. Yes. It's been a privilege. Yeah, my yeah, question, small question too is like uh, how you spoke about the strategic culture of Pakistan. My mm -hmm. brief question is how do you see the role of the non state actors, like both on India, on the side of India and Pakistan? Do they create a hindrance uh, so far these two countries and the resolution of their problems are concerned? Thank you. Okay, Dr. Yeah. Balvinder Kumar, please uh, go ahead, ask your question or make your comment. Okay, congratulations, uh, Professor Bajpayee, sir. I am a student at um, CPOD. You have uh, selected my PhD topic. So uh, today my question to you is that whether India uh, and Pakistan is the best case for cooperation and an RP and whether we can solve this through stick and carrot policy or through bilateral or multinational or trilateral. Is there any scope for United Nations to solve this problem? Yes, sir. Thank you. I think we'll close with that and uh, uh, Professor okay. Bajpayee can you know, make a concluding uh, kind of response. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much. I mean, the first uh, one was from Pramod on uh, the um, uh, changes in Kashmir on both sides and uh, also the uh, possibility then, excuse me, of moving towards uh, perhaps a, a definition of the border more or less around the LOC. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think Certainly, uh, the decision of August the 5th has set some things in motion on the Indian side, clearly. Um, there have been changes uh, coming in Pakistan. I haven't followed all of them over the years, but um, you know, with respect to Gilgit and so on, there been, there's been a movement there. I mean, the broad sense I have is that um, on the Pakistani side, uh, a greater acceptance that you know, uh, not just uh, so-called uh, POK or what they call Azad Kashmir, but also Gilgit Baltistan will be, will kind of be moved towards a more normal sort of uh, 
status in 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 Pakistan. Um, so there are some changes that have been occurring there. Uh, of course, we've had the August fifth change uh, here, and uh, uh, to my mind, actually, you know, again, uh, there are worries in these changes, but it may be that something like the vision that. Uh, uh, Vajpayee, Nawaz Sharif, Manmohan, and Musharraf had at that time of a possible deal that these changes are not necessarily, they don't necessarily rule them out. Um, I'm thinking of the kind of uh, discussion that uh, the back channel had during the Manmohan Singh uh, Musharraf period. And one of the elements there was that the relationship of uh, essentially of uh, Delhi to its side of Kashmir and of Islamabad to uh, its um, uh, parts of uh, Kashmir, that they would try to kind of move them in a more parallel dis uh, direction. Uh, that the kinds of uh, relationships between the central governments and these two, I'll just call them provinces or states, just for a shortcut, so please don't get offended legalistically and all that just for the shortcut, uh, that that relationship will be, you know, would tend to on both sides mirror each other more. Towards what? Towards greater autonomy. Um, so if that was the case, then that parallelism uh, potentially, I mean, these changes that have now occurred on both sides, uh, been in motion, might not rule that out. And that would be probably quite important if you imagine the second element that Manmohan and Musharraf, and before that, uh, you know, there was discussion, the Vajpayee was aware of them and, and, and so on, of soft borders. I mean, Manmohan outed soft borders most dramatically, but of course, uh, Vajpayee was very aware of it and the Pakistani side was aware of it because it goes back to an idea of the so-called Kashmir study group, which was funded by an American, uh, a, a furniture mogul living in the United States. Uh, whose study group had come up with something very similar. And that was, um, when they came up with that idea, you know, the time wasn't right for it to be transmitted into public discourse. But in a way, it kind of was there. And where it comes from, this idea of soft borders, is the following, I think, which I wrote about also many years ago. I mean, it's not, uh, I just said it slightly differently, which is that if there's one thing that deep down or legalistically, officially, the two sides are agreed on, is that they don't agree that the LOC is the solution. The Pakistanis very formally have rejected it. But let's remember there's a formal Indian position, which is that all of Kashmir belongs to India. Well, what is that saying? It's saying that LOC is not the answer on the Indian side also. So uh, oddly enough, there's a kind of differentiated but common perception that the LOC uh, is not necessarily the answer. Now, going to amount to. But what I think Musharraf and Manmohan kind of agreed to is that there won't be any tinkering with the LOC, really. That what will happen instead is that they'll kind of transcend the LOC. That's what the soft borders is. We'll just put a bracket around the issue of the final border settlement or, or the status of Kashmir, same thing. Uh, we won't make a final determination. We'll just put this LOC issue and the border into cold storage. And in the meantime, let's try and resume a kind of common social life of Kashmir through soft borders. So you won't need a passport if you're a Kashmiri on this side to go to the other side. There'll be some notification kind of way of doing it. And you can apply some trade. If you have relatives, you can see them. Maybe you wouldn't be allowed to go from your two parts of Kashmir into the rest of those two countries, but you could move laterally more easily, do a bit of trade, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's what it is to restore the social life of Kashmir in effect without determining a boundary. And third, if your arrangements between Delhi and Islamabad towards your parts of Kashmir are similar, then one can envisage, as they did, some kind of common municipal arrangements, right? So maybe dealing with, I don't know, some local water issues, 
There was one talk many, many years ago in that period of maybe we could have a common tourism policy package so that internal tourists or foreign tourists, especially uh, non-South Asians who wanted to come and see Kashmir from Baltistan and Hunza to the valley could move laterally rather than them flying back to Delhi and then flying to each other's countries and then traveling back up to Kashmir to visit their respective sites. But, you know, I mean, I'm just chucking out a kind of uh, memory that I had of somewhere I heard this idea of, uh, so dealing with water, maybe local power arrangements, electricity and so on, tourism, etc. This could be some common uh, municipal functions. And accompanied with that would be, as they agreed, uh, with, with, they finally did agree, was that if all of that happened, then there could be some pullback of troops from the lines of control, and all these deadly ceasefire violations and so on could be avoided, and law and order and so on, and lightly armed police forces or armed police at the border, uh, or LOC, and then, of course, normal policing functions within uh, the two sides of Kashmir. You know, this is broadly the kind of picture that emerged from all these discussions about what a soft border solution might look like, which is leave the LOC uh, issue alone, forget about it, leave it to history for 15, 20 years at least, or longer. If everything else works in this resuming the social life of Kashmir, then maybe both sides would get to the point where they're comfortable in determining a final boundary. Okay, so I think maybe knocking on and on about Determining the LOC as a solution may not be the solution. It may get us into the problem rather than the solution. More of the problem. Um, it's a long answer, but I needed to sort of uh, flesh it out a bit to show you the logic of why it, it, they thought it was plausible. Um, and it could be someday. And then I think Chandra Bhushan, Dr. Chandra Bhushan's question uh, about um, non-state actors. I mean, of course, generally there's a presumption that when we say non-state actors, in a liberal way, we're talking about nice civil society actors who do, you know, take candles to the border. And uh, as uh, uh, Farooq uh, Khan was saying, that, you know, the, we, uh, we get on Zoom together and talk to each other in a constructive and positive way. You know, that's kind of the way we think of civil society and non-state actors. But of course, there are the dark sides of civil society. The non-state actors who uh, dislike each other, who are violent, who are extremists, who are... Uh, deaf to each other's concerns and have all kinds of horrible views of each other, the othering uh, that we talked about uh, when Khan Sahib spoke. So, you know, uh, yeah, there are these non-state actors and uh, they also impact strategic cultures uh, and strategic thinking. Um, and uh, uh, on both sides, I would say, I mean, uh, it's not that uh, the extreme views are only on one side. And, um, so these non-state actors, they're, they're difficult to deal with. Uh, they can be very powerful, they can have numbers, they sometimes have links to governments, which are a bit subterranean. You can't see them very clearly, but they exist and governments will disavow them, but actually they're influenced by them because they can be mobilized, they, they're mobilizers. So, you know, uh, one has to think about how to, to handle them um, uh, uh, quite carefully. And one thinks, I mean, the classic liberal, responses, education, socialization, the media, uh, even discussions with extremists, one's own extremists to try and persuade them to soften up. Uh, but all that is e easier said than done. I mean, just look at what's happening in the United States. Um, there is a polarized situation there and the two sides can hardly talk to each other, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, let alone convince each other. So I think that one of the dark sides of open liberal societies now with access to a lot of media, uh, different platforms is that, you know, you're also empowering uh, non-state actors that have uh, very negative views, uh, very violent views potentially. And nobody quite knows how that is to be handled. Um, but uh, certainly it will take strong, a strong government or state to respond to it. Uh, and my one kind of fear is, worry for a long time has been, is that, and actually this paper initially took that, that trope or that idea, which was that weak states can't cooperate because they can't carry through on deals that they strike. That's the commitment problem. 
uh, in IR. Um, but for various reasons, I edited that out of the paper. Um, and, but I still maintain that, you know, uh, you need strong states. And we may think in India and Pakistan for different reasons, we have strong states. Actually, we have very weak states. We have uh, states that can hit us over the head very hard when they want to, whether it's a Pakistani military government or a civilian government that's very powerful, like under Bhutto and can be very coercive and mean, or whether it's, you know, uh, police forces in India or a very powerful government, state government or central government in India, which can hit you over the head when it wants to. But that's not state strength. Actually, those are signs of weakness. State strength is strong policy capacity, the ability to, with of strategic communication to your own people. Can you persuade? Can you convince? Can you carry out a rational discourse that carefully weighs up policy options and and places it before a population, stands by it, implements it, once there is support for it. That's a strong state. A strong state is not hitting people over the head and bullying them and on both sides of the border. So if you want to deal with the dark side of uh, you know, civil society, these non-state actors who are intolerant and difficult to deal with, you need strong states. I mean, if you look at the Indian, I don't know the Pakistani case, but I'm assuming it's more or less the same. You look at the policing function in India, the, just the number of policemen per, I don't know, whatever it is, million population. In, in a study of 75 countries that's been done several years, India ranks 73rd or something out of 75 countries. I don't know if Pakistan was in that study, but I'm assuming it's the same. The number of policemen you can put on the streets to, I mean, you can have all the laws you want and norms you want. But for those who breach those norms and break those norms, you've got to have enough policemen out there to catch people, take them to the thana, uh, put a case against them. Then you need a judiciary that has enough judicial officers that can see. We have one of the lowest numbers of, judici uh, of judges amongst the uh, you know, 40, 50 countries that, that matter. Uh, the bureaucracy, we think there's too much bureaucracy, but there are too few bureaucrats. When we say there's too much bureaucracy, there are too many rules and laws but not enough expert, dedicated civil servants. Very, very few. I mean, look at the Indian Foreign Service. I mean, uh, 800 personnel. That's about what Belgium has or some such, whatever the figures are. And there are views on that. But I mean, it's a tiny, tiny. We have in India one MP for 2 million people. Sri Lanka, they have one MP for 83,000 people. That's political capacity. How does an MP reach out to a constituency of 2 million people and growing. Because the population is growing, but the uh, house is still 560 MPs. How do you reach out to and know the views of and persuade constituents when you're, you've you got 2 million people on average in your constituency? Just, so the, these are very weak states. They look strong, but they're extremely weak. The ability to reach out, convince, control, persuade, uh, implement is very limited. Uh, look at the law and order situation 20 miles outside the nation's capitals, uh, and you can see it. Anyway, uh, so I think that you can't really deal with non-state actors who are so difficult if you have such weak states. So long-term uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, capacity building is necessary. Last point, I mean, to Balvinder Kumar, Dr. Kumar. Um, yeah, I mean, in a way you're right. Uh, uh, this uh, cycles of cooperation, of cooperation and defection, if you go back to that literature on cooperation under anarchy with uh, Kenneth Oy and uh, 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 Robert Cohane and uh, Robert Axelrod, th that showed that uh, if you're playing a mixed motive game, and this is game theory, uh, and uh, if you follow a strategy of TFT, tit for tat, you defect when the other side defects and you cooperate when the other side cooperates, over a long period of time, that strategy wins. And you can achieve cooperation because it's a winning strategy and the two sides actually can figure out then norms of behavior and so on. Uh, Axelrod showed it even at the epidemiological level where he showed that a certain number of cells going into a hostile environment, if they cooperate, uh, whatever that means, 
it can uh, turn the body into a, a recuperative uh, phase. But anyway, he showed it, so, tried to show it sociologically. A small number of cooperators in a larger grouping will elicit cooperation. So is this a case then, this, these cycles, uh, is it that India defects when Pakistan defects and pa likewise the Pakistanis do? And if Pakistan offers cooperation, that India offers cooperation. And if India offers cooperation, the Pakistanis do. There is actually, if you read the paper, it will come out uh, hopefully in about a year in an edited book for Steve Cohen. Um, you could read the paper that way. Uh, I almost wrote it that way. But uh, it seemed a bit too um, kind of, uh, you know, a mechanical and uh, didn't allow me to uh, bring out some of these other factors. But uh, you can show that, you know, Nawaz Sharif offered cooperation in 1996, Vajpayee followed up, Cargill occurred. Unfortunately, Musharraf defected, uh, India defected, then uh, Vajpayee showed cooperation leading to Agra, you know, uh, both defected, uh, they couldn't have come to an agreement or whatever. Um, but there seems to be a repeated attempt to, uh, uh, to show cooperation and then to receive. Now, i just end with this. Many years ago, uh, a very famous University of Illinois professor by the name of, um, uh, uh, well, he wrote this book called Grit, uh, or this was his conception. Uh, his name was Charles Osgood. He wrote a, a book called, I think, Between War and Surrender. He was dealing with the US-Soviet arms control problem in the 70s and 80s. He had in mind something similar to this tit for tatting. But he said that what was quite crucial is one tit for two tats and that kind of behavior, which is when you offer cooperation or make a concession, it's got to be such that it looks meaningful to the other side. So it shouldn't be easily retractable and it shouldn't be costless to you. If it's easily retractable and costless, then the other side could be very cynical about it and say, oh, well, what is that? Nothing. Uh, you're not giving me anything. Uh, you're not taking a risk. So why should I reciprocate with anything equally risky or costly to me? And it peters out. So I think if I just close my eyes and I think about my own paper, and I'm glad you asked this question at the end. One way of reading the collapse of cooperation may be is that in the end, neither party made a unilateral concession or a costly kind of uh, you know gesture towards the other, where it was at risk of being exploited, but it was willing to take that risk, uh, and so it was not in the end quite convincing enough to the other side, you know, and so it may have petered out as a result, which comes back to this idea of the strong state. A strong state can probably do that but a weak state cannot do that because it's too scared of the blowback within its own constituents. Uh, so, I mean, I hate to end on a somewhat pessimistic uh, note, but you don't build a strong state overnight. Uh, and you don't want a strong state that's a tyrannical state, uh, but a strong state that, you know, is uh, representative of its population, involves it, participates with it, and is able to take courageous decisions and stick by it after explaining the rationale. That takes time. And I don't think India and Pakistan are there. Uh, these are not strong states. So uh, let me just stop there. And uh, from my side, uh, let me thank you all very much for sticking out for so long. And uh, I spoke too long thank usually, you, uh, which is uh, always a bit of a worry. But uh, uh, Zoom, I think, lends itself to a nice long uh, discussions and uh, so I'm very grateful to you. I'm especially grateful, of course, to Rina for setting this up and uh, patiently, uh, you know, uh, seeing it through and allowing us to extend. And of course, uh, to Swaran for uh, being a prime mover as well and and uh, moderating it so brilliantly and and of course giving us a very thoughtful introduction to the whole session and uh, laying out a whole uh, program. I'm uh, very impressive and. Uh, uh, happy to be part of it and uh, maybe someday in the future to do it again. So from my side, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Vajpayee. Given the number of questions I still have, in fact, I have two participants who are on my screen and want to ask questions, but I'm going to close it now Yeah. because we've really gone too far today. I yeah. will urge those uh, participants, in all participants to come to the next end. After that also, we have two coming sessions which will deal with Pakistan. 
So yeah. apologies to people who are on my screen want to ask, but I'm closing it now. But happy to answer them offline in email. So you, uh, you could give them my email address. Okay. So let me say uh, thank you very much to each of the participants, uh, especially to my dear friend Kuru Khan and uh, Naushin Basi. Yes, thank you so much. All, uh, uh, my sincere thanks to Professor thank Kanchi for being so indulgent with us. And I'll hand over now uh, back to Professor Rina Marva for the formal closing of a vote of thanks. Uh, Rina Marva. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kanti Bajpai. You enough in a few words. Uh, uh, truly, you come from a family of diplomats and uh, you have expressed yourself so well, explaining diligently and so brilliantly uh, the cycles of uh, defection and cooperation. Uh, in fact, uh, many of us, I think, did not really know that, you know, there were so many avenues of cooperation between India and Pakistan. Uh, given the fact that in recent times, it's the negative narrative which prevails very strongly. So these uh, pragmatic uh, ways forward, which you have suggested, given the August and uh, with China-Pakistan uh, relationship becoming even stronger, I think uh, you have really... Uh, you know, sort of expressed uh, so many uh, varied issues, but all interrelated uh, absolutely brilliantly. A lot which uh, each participant has taken away. And the fact that, you know, almost 50 participants stayed with us for three hours. This is actually a record in our 12th uh, webinar session. So all the thanks, all the kudos, uh, all the uh, appreciation goes to you. Thank you so much. And I'm sure there'll be an opportunity for us to reach out to you again and uh, bring you back as a speaker again in one of our, uh, you know, forthcoming initiatives, given that Google has stated they're going to allow their employees to work, uh, you know, from home till next summer. So we don't know yeah. how long we are going to continue in this format. And especially this semester, we are certainly going to be teaching online and possibly the next semester as well. So we wish you to keep safe and well, and thank you very much for your indulgence. Very kind, very generous, very magnanimous of you indeed. Uh, we are totally, totally overwhelmed by your, uh, your you know, brilliant uh, bringing in from, you know, such a vast review of literature and uh, presenting your own viewpoint along with that. I think you've provided an extremely balanced and interesting uh, you know, format to the entire presentation and question and answer. Thank you to each one for being with us, for staying with us, for encouraging us. And please do register for our next uh, Wednesday's webinar again at 11.30 in the morning. And we have Professor Siegfried or Wolf Research Director, South Asia Democratic Forum, to speak to us on Pakistan and the future of Afghanistan. So we really look forward uh, to you all. Please join us next week again. Thank you for your questions. And we do hope that you also learned as much as we did. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank all. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Thank you. Safe. Thank you, very much. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again, Swaran, Rina. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bhatt.